Welcome, and uh, we're happy to see you all here tonight. Uh, this is the Select Board Board of Health Sewer Commissioners meeting of May 15, um, here in the town hall, municipal offices. This meeting will be held in a hybrid fashion with the opportunity for both in-person attendance and remote participation. Please note that while an option for remote attendance and or participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt the virtual broadcast unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public with particular interest in any specific item on this agenda should make plans for in-person versus virtual attendance accordingly. The meeting will be held in person in the main meeting room of the Deerfield Municipal Offices in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 30A. Anyone intending to record the meeting must identify themselves to the clerk, Blake Gilmore, and provide their name and address for the record. So at this time, I'll call the meeting to order at 6.01. And um, we have public comment uh, briefly. That's anybody who wants to make a two-minute comment is welcome to come up to the mic, identify themselves, and speak. And, uh, Otherwise, we'll go on with the meeting. Anyone on recording who wants to make a comment? Seeing none, we'll uh, continue on. Uh, now, we have um, specific time for this. these hearings. Are these official hearings, or are these just times for people to be here, Casey? The Primo's hearing is official. OK, yep. so um, we, we could go ahead with Chris Mason. You could. If Chris is here, definitely. Um, yes, he appears to be. Come on up, Chris. Chris. Yeah, right, right there in the front. Pull the mic forward for you. And you need to swallow the mic. Yep. Don't even look at the screen. Same no, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's fine. And if you need any assistance. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Is that welcome? welcome. Yep. You, you kind of have to sort of eat really the yep. I'm sorry. Can I be like a rock star? <laughs> yes, exactly. You got it. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, as you know, I'm speaking on these. Uh, Could you please identify yourself? And yeah. Yes, thank Chris you. Mason. I'm the Western Mass Regional Coordinator for the Green Communities Program, Department of Energy Resources. And I'm presenting tonight on the specialized stretch code uh, in context with the um, Climate Leaders Communities Program from the DOER, which I presented to the uh, Board of Selectmen three months ago. Okay. Um, so the climate leaders pre uh, uh, presentation um, I gave about three months ago, but I'm going to go over quickly here to, be, um, to kind of put things in context. Okay, you, let's go to the next slide. Can you minimize that, Casey, by mm -hmm. clicking? Thank you. Okay, today's presentation, overview of Climate Leader Communities Program, and then going into the specialized stretch code. So go to the next slide. Um, putting this in context, back in 2008, the Green Communities, I mean, uh, the Global Warming Solutions Act was passed, and then uh, more recently, uh, in 2021, the Climate Act was signed, and the difference largely here was the, the state has moved from really focusing on energy efficiency to carbon reduction. And where the Green Communities Program uh, helps municipalities uh, do a lot with energy efficiency, it's been shifting more and more towards carbon reduction, uh, changing uh, where we get our fuel from. And the, the uh, Climate Leaders Communities uh, Program is kind of in response to that. So it's a new program that's really aimed more towards uh, uh, greenhouse gas reductions. Next slide. Hey, um, just a quick reminder. I think two of you have seen this presentation already. I understand we have one new member. I don't think I've seen it. I don't remember this. I okay, well then it's meeting, good. It's so. good to go yeah. over this. This is really brief. So when we get to question and answers, you know, ask me any questions. Mm -hmm. But so the requirements for certification is um, first, you must be an existing green community in good standing. Your field is. Um, you must establish or maintain some kind of a local community uh, uh, um, advisory group or. Uh, a citizens um, group to help you with, uh, with implementing the projects, which Deerfield has. You need to commit to municipal decarbonization by 2050. This is kind of matching what the state has done. The state has a goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions 
almost to net zero by 2050 and then carbon um, sequestration to get the rest of the way. Um, uh, what that means in a nutshell is for municipal operations, transportation and uh, heating and cooling, is to stop burning fossil fuels on site by 2050 and kind of relying on the fact that as you electrify, you know, convert over to electric, high efficiency electric heat pumps, for instance, battery electric vehicles, you then kind of ride on the back of the state, which is driving down the greenhouse gas emissions for an electric sector. Um, so this is this kind of the general strategy, uh, and so the community would have to commit to municipal decarbonization by 2050, and then formulate a very broad roadmap on how to get there. Um, You'd have to adopt the zero emissions vehicle first vehicle policy. Uh, in a nutshell, that's saying if you've got a vehicle that needs to be replaced and there is a battery electric vehicle or a fuel cell electric vehicle out there that could do the job, then that's what you would be saying. That's what your policy would say that you would, you would go with. If there's not a battery electric vehicle, um, but there's a plug-in hybrid, then that would be what you would go for. And then kind of going down in hierarchy, a hybrid, and then basically a high efficiency vehicle. Um, uh, so that, that would be a policy that the town would have to adopt. And then last, what we're here for tonight, you would have to adopt a specialized stretch code. Okay, next slide. So instead of uh, the Green Communities Program has, puts in an annual report, uh, as Casey very well knows, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> once a year to make sure that you guys are doing everything you're supposed to be doing and, and continuing to and are eligible for the grants and stuff like that. Um, uh, with the uh, um, Climate Leaders Communities Program, uh, there'll be a recertification process every three years. So demonstrate you're still meeting the, the uh, certification requirements, update your decarbonization roadmap, and show that you've implemented one kind of community engagement climate leader best practice. And that's, I'm not gonna go into it now because I'm trying to go over this quickly, but that's really broad. It could be anything from setting a policy for bicycles somehow to doing a solarized type program where you're trying to help your community adopt re uh, renewable energy. It's very broad and we're open to ideas there. Okay, next, uh, next slide. Um, this is one reason why you may be interested in that. So the top slide, the top row there, um, the Green Communities has an existing competitive grant. And that's constrained to certain things. You can apply for certain things that are very much so to do with energy efficiency. And right now, some greenhouse gas reductions by uh, fuel switching. Um, but, but it's not completely broad. If you become a climate leader community, it's gonna, you, what, you can, what you can apply for is gonna broaden quite a bit. So for instance, um, we haven't supported anybody, uh, the communities applying for a grant for solar PV on a town building. If you become a climate leader community, then that could become one of the things that you, you could apply for. Um, so it's going to broaden what you can apply for. The second row, the climate leader accelerator grant, the state's found a new pot of money that's quite big. And uh, so we're talking about much larger grants that are going to be aimed really for be building de decarbonization, you know, large on-site solar storage, geothermal technologies. We recognize that this decarbonization and fuel switching um, can mean you need to make some big investments in your building. Often you want to wrap them in when you're actually doing capital improvement projects. Uh, so there's a smart way of doing this. That's what the roadmap can help you do. But um, this is providing funds of, I'm, I'm hearing this is going to be on the order of, you know, quarter million dollar grants or above. <clears throat> um, so the first climate leader will, uh, if, if they apply, will be in July. Um, so right after July, we'll have our first climate leader communities. And the first grant pond for the climate accelerator will be issued sometime in the late summer or fall of 2024. But there will be f other times you can apply. You, if you don't get an application period in July, you can get there in, in um, December. And then there will be another one in next July. Okay, next slide. Um, actually, maybe I should pause just briefly. I don't want to get in depth in the climate leader communities, but is there any clarification questions on that? Okay, great. So the opt-in specialized energy code, which is what we're really here for. Next slide. So right now, Massachusetts has three different uh, energy codes that they could be operating, any town could be operating under. The base code, the stretch code, which is Deerfield's current code, um, and then the specialized code, or the net zero code. Um, 
So about 50 communities are still on the base code. It's about 9% of the population. Uh, the stretch code, there are about 260 communities or 63% of the population is operating on the stretch code. And um, the specialized code, which is fairly new, has already got 41 communities. So actually, that's wrong. It's 43 communities. Um, I happen to know that two more came in uh, just yesterday. Um, next slide. This is a map showing where those communities are. The darker blue is the specialized stretch code. Uh, the light blue is the stretch code itself. And then the off-white are the uh, ones that are still in the base energy code. Next slide. Um, the stretch code, even the base code to some extent, and the uh, specialized code all rely on this thing called a HERS process. Um, uh, do I, are, is everybody familiar with that? Yep. Okay, no, okay, okay. So the home energy rating system. It's a way of actually measuring the energy efficiency of a home. Uh, the way it's used in new construction is uh, just it's some background I think you should use, you need for this. So um, you would hire a HERS rater that would go over the building plans and, and, and do a computer simulation on its energy use and make sure you have a construction that you can actually get to the HERS rating you're looking for um, by building this house. Then as you go through the building process, while the house is still open enough for you to actually inspect things before you put the sheetrock up, say, then the, the home manager rater will come in and they'll actually test the house and inspect things. So you know you're getting the kind of insulation and air sealing that you want um, as you're doing the building before, so you don't have to go back afterwards and, and kind of tear a wall apart. Um, when it's finally finished, um, a blower door is attached to the house, which actually may be used during those intermittent, intermittent periods as well. Um, and you actually test the airflow going through the house. You know what kind of insulation is in the house. And you can, again, using the modeling, you can, you can come up with a HERS rating, which is then just handed to the building inspector. And the building inspector can say, OK, great, they passed the code um, because I got the HERS rating that fits. Next slide. This is a simplified history of HERS rating. First, let's, let's go to the, the right-hand side. You can see. A HERS rating of 140 would be like existing homes, historically existing homes. Um, a HERS rating of 100 would be a more typical spec-built spec house back of, of, say, the 1980s, 1990s spec-built house. Right now, the HERS rating average for Massachusetts is 51. If you get down to a HERS zero, you, uh, you, you can't do that without having some kind of um, uh, renewable energy generation on sites, like a solar panel. But what a, a HER zero means is that you are producing as much electricity over the course of a year as, you, as the house uses. So it's basically net neutral. Um, so the lower the HERS rating, uh, the tighter the house, the more energy efficient the house. If you look at the, uh, it, so all codes get updated roughly every three years. There's little things that kind of stop it sometimes from actually happening on a three year schedule. But, uh, the base code changes every three years. The stretch code um, rides on top of that, and it changes every three years. Um, and right now, you're looking at 2023. You can see uh, the base code um, is at 55. The stretch code is at a HERS 52. And if you had the specialized code in, going in effect right now, it would be a HERS 42. In July of 2024, the stretch code is going to drop down to that 42 as well. And I should be, you're, you're going to see a slight difference in, in, later on. It's a 42, 45, depending on what kind of building it is. I'll, you'll, you'll see that later on. Um, but historically, over time, um, the, as the stretch code has gotten a lower HERS rating, the base code <clears throat> has come along right afterwards and kind of matched it. So it, it's, it kind of trails that. It doesn't quite see, you can't see that in this chart <clears throat> because it's a simplified chart, but that's the way it's kind of worked. Uh, next slide. Okay, so <clears throat> here now I'm, I'm going to go into the difference between your current code, the stretch code, and the specialized code. Um, for low-rise residential, if you built an all-electric home, and what I mean by that, it's heated and cooled by electricity, high-efficiency heat pumps is the standard way nowadays. It's got um, electric conductive stove, uh, electric dryer, electric hot water heating, so basically, if you're not burning fossil fuels on site, if you're not, if you're not doing combustion on site, then um, it would be considered an all-electric home. The and thumbs up for it. Oh, I'm getting the point. Oh. Oops. 
But who's mm-hmm. talking? Sing cat. Can we mute? Can thank I you. Can't say. <laughs> I think we're good. Go ahead. Okay. So um, if you build in an all-electric home, then the specialized code wouldn't affect you. Um, yes, you would just be operating the same as you would with the stretch code. Um, if you have a home addition or alterations, that's like the third major categories down right there. Again, the stre- specialized code won't, address, won't, won't affect you. Um, uh, specialized code only affects new buildings. Uh, so you're going to stick with the stretch code for any kind of home alterations or additions. Um, historic or existing homes, uh, there's energy code exemptions. I actually think which actually go back down to even the base code. Um, so it, you know, there's exemptions for historic or existing homes um, throughout, and that won't change with the specialized code. Um, where the specialized code will kick in is if you have what we call a mixed fuel home. That's a house that somewhere burns combustion, and somewhere has combustion on site um, uh, to provide a service. And um, if you do, then you have to uh, um, meet the same stretch code, HERS 42. You need to, and then you need to wire f- for any of those appliances that are using combustion. Um, you would need to wire, pre-wire so that when the, a future occupant of the house wants to, sw- say, swap out the electric, I mean, the gas range for an electric range, that they can without opening up the house and running new wires. So it's basically pre, pre-preparing the house to, for electrification. And then depending on the size of the building, under 4,000 square feet, you need to put in a solar PV array. Um, over 4,000 square feet, you need to put a solar PV in array that's large enough to get you to net zero. Um, uh, there's another, okay, that, that last uh, passive house option, uh, that's another pathway to meeting the building code it's another kind of stringent way of building a building, commercial or, or residential, um, that doesn't really use a HERS rating, but that's a, a pathway that's allowed. And if you do that, you'd also need to wire for electrification if there's gas um, or some kind of fossil fuel in there. The solar PV piece, I want to say, if you've got a shaded site, we're not going to, you know, the code's not going to require you to put in a PV array. Um, uh, if um, if the house doesn't face south, if, 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 if there isn't a possibility for a good solar array, we're not going to require you to put it in. Next slide. I'll go into that in a little more detail. So for a mixed fuel building, solar required when there is a suitable solar roof zone of 300 square feet or greater. And for all electric buildings, solar is not required. You just want solar ready roofs. Solar ready roofs means you've run the chase, not even the wires, you've run the chase so that when someone puts an array on top of the roof, they know where they're going to run their wires down. They might even put the array someplace else, but you've got to apply you know, um, some avenue for them to be able to run the wires down to the electric panel. So again, so you don't have to open the house up and run wires, uh, or run wires down, down, down the outside of the house um, when ready. Uh, okay, next slide. So um, the multifamily, um, so four, four plus stories over 12,000 square feet, um, in either case, your pathway, HERS 45, TEDI, that's thermal energy density intensity, another pathway that you could use under the stretch code, or passive house. Those three pathways for multifamily um, narrow down to just the use in the passive house um, for mixed fuel. And then if you have a mixed, I mean, I'm sorry, for, for um, uh, multifamily. And then if you have a mixed fuel um, uh, building of some kind, then you also need to pre-wire for electrification again. Um, that's really kind of, that, that's about it. The stre- specialized code isn't that much of a difference be- over the stretch code. Next slide. We'll go to the commercial buildings. This is very similar to the residential. You'll see that um, all electric school offices, municipal buildings, other commercial, if they're all electric buildings, then the specialized code doesn't kick in. Um, it's still, you still are operating with your current code. And then um, if you have mixed fuel, uh, you, you, know, you then again, as before, have to wire for electrification and add solar. All right, next slide. An important one. 
All of this does cost a bit more money in, in cases, although I will say all electric homes are generally cheaper to build. If you, if you have someone in town who's really trying to, you know, is having a hard, hard time affording a house, they're gonna wanna build an all electric building. They're gonna be able to build a cheaper building if it's all electric. And as you see, as I said before, the specialized code um, doesn't kick in because of that. Then they're in the same situation they are with your current building code. So folks who are trying to build a low income house, or not low income house, but a lower cost house, um, who are really trying to keep their initial costs down, then this, adopting the specialized code is not gonna affect you. For the mass save one to four units, uh, you have to go to the passive house, which is a tight um, uh, uh, pathway. Um, and there's a little bit of cost about getting a passive house tested. Uh, then one to four unit all electric homes, the mass save is gonna give you $15,000 for a HERS rating of 45, or $25,000 for a HERS rating of 35. And then mass save multifamily passive house, you can get $3,000 per unit plus design study funding. Um, and then on top of that, there's the federal tax credits, $2,500 to $5,000 home for the zero energy ready home tax credit, um, depending on your HERS rating. And then there's a commercial, the uh, 179D tax credit for commercial and multifamily, um, $6 per square feet. So there's a whole bunch of subsidies and um, incentives that are designed to go along with the stretch code and the specialized stretch code. Um, I was at a conference yesterday where they were, give, they, was, they were really focused on municipal stuff and someone from National Grid gave an overview of, um, uh, of where, where they were aiming for the next three year plan. I should say for just similar to the base code or, or the, the building codes, uh, this mass save program changes every three years as well. The Energy Efficiency Advisory Council tells it what it needs to do <coughs> and they come up with a new set of incentives. So um, I specifically asked, I said, so do you have new incentives coming out for, um, for new homes? For new homes. This is unusual this for is Mass Save to actually provide incentives for a code built house, and they are doing that now. They are doing that. Can we mute, please? I'll mute my volume online. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So just a quick question, sure. um, if I might. Um, the federal IRA stuff, is that a one-time and when you build it thing, or is this something that is available for a period of years? I'm just trying to understand the 2500 and the 5000 credit. Tax credit. So my that's my one time. My understanding is it's, it's there. One no, but I mean, just, if I build a house yeah. and I get a $5,000 credit, I just get one of those. I don't know. You know you're saying if you build a second house, do you get no, another no, one? No, no, I'm just saying yearly. if I build a house, yeah. I can get one credit. It doesn't, it's not like a yearly thing. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Yes, okay, yep. No, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I would say, actually, in this case, you really don't need to because your energy costs are gonna be so low mm -hmm. um, that you, you won't need subsidies. Um, I will mention that the uh, three-year energy efficiency plan that MassSafe has to come out with every year is currently under review. So I did leave a, um, uh, an, a, a website here, and if you wanted to actually see what they're, gonna, if you, what they're proposing, it's only draft at the moment. If you wanted to see what they're proposing, you could go up and, and look for it. I haven't actually dove into it yet. But uh, the gentleman from National Grid did assure us that yes, MassSafe is going to be continuing to be supporting um, the high efficiency homes. Um, so this isn't gonna be incentives that just disappear right away. Um, all right, uh, next slide. All right, uh, so how you adopt specialized code, you adopt it through uh, um, a warrant on town meeting, it needs to be voted by town meeting or city council. Um, you set an effective date, we prefer if that be January 1st or July 1st. We also recommend that you delay this six to 12 months after you adopt it so that the building community has a, you know, a little chance to kind of get re ready for it and stuff. Um, but that's it, it's just uh, adopted through town meeting. Next slide. Um, so just, I think I've kind of gone through most of these during, uh, during my presentation. And next slide. 
So I, so I added the provide input to draft 2025, 2027, three year energy efficiency plan to this. You can get energy code training for anybody you need in town or you know, building inspector if, if, uh, or uh, builders, they can get trainings. Um, there's some resources here. And I think I just open it up to questions at this point. So um, I'm in this industry. This all okay. sounds good, but what happens in the real world out there building houses, very difficult. I mean, even the, even the, the base stretch code is changing in July. It's costing a ton of money to do this work, uh, making it much harder to get, you know, I'm in the window industry, it's very difficult to meet any of the new codes. You need to, uh, you know, you can't build really with double hungs anymore in the future because you've, you just can't reach those energy requirements. It has to be a triple glaze, very expensive window to meet some of the new codes. Um, the builders are struggling out there. The contractors are struggling. Any new homeowners trying to build, um, we have a massive, lack of home homes i mean that's the major push from the governor is lack of housing and we every year or every three years make it harder and harder and harder and more expensive to build it's very difficult for a young family uh starting out to build a house i mean it sounds like it's you know oh, there's some credits here and this and that but it's not it is land is very expensive you know all the permitting the hers rating alone is five or six thousand dollars and you have to pay it and the Hearst Raiders have made out like a bandit in this industry. I mean, they are just rolling in, in money. I asked one to do a presentation for us. He said, I said, well, you get, you know, information out to contractors. You could get business. That He goes, I don't need any business. I get all the business I can, I can dream of. They're constantly, you know, ha forcing everybody. I think it's important. We need to address climate change and we need to move forward um, incentivizing people to do stuff. But forcing them to do it is a lot, it, it, that's where I kind of draw the line. We have, we have moved farther ahead. This town does a lot as far as energy efficiency in green communities, but forcing people to move uh, to a very strict energy code just to be able to build in this community is just, I think, the wrong answer. I think it's, you need to incentivize people. The state can help with subsidies to do that, but to, to, but to force people to do it, it should be a choice on their own. It shouldn't be you are demanded to do this. And that, that's where I think this has gone, you know, way in the other direction. I understand the problem we're dealing with. And, um, and people want to build energy efficient homes. It's just getting unbelievably expensive to build anything out there. If you do an addition on a house that's 50% larger than the house that you're, that you're working on, you've got to bring up the rest of the house up to code. And that's a very, you know, very difficult task with some of the old homes in our, in our area. I mean, we built really crappy homes through the 80s, 70s and 80s. I mean, just two by four, half inch plywood, really hardly any insulation. So we have work to do, but trying to bring that, the expense of it all to build houses today. The only people building right now are second homes. A lot of people, second homeowners, they have, you know, a million dollar home, no problem at all. They don't mind paying the money. They want the triple glass. They want all the energy efficiency, but young families trying to build a home today, I just don't see how they can do it. I mean, you look around, there's just not enough building going on, and it's, and it's because of the cost. So I, I struggle with wanting to adopt a, a, a more stringent code. That's just my two cents, but anyone else? So is there anyone in the audience or online that would like to ask a question? We're, we're doing questions here. Uh, can you come up and- Come to a mic. Yeah, yep. I think that mic there behind Chris is available. Please identify yourself to the, so the record. Uh, I'm, I'm Stephen Swoboda. Um, Can you speak into the mic too, Steve? That one does not work. Is it not on? Yes, come over here, Steve. Come sit. Sorry, we'll get this figured out. <laughs> no, that's all right. No, I, I, I can redo it. <laughs> Stephen Swoboda, North Main Street. Um, no, I, I, I've seen this issue for a long time. I'm very fortunate that uh, I'm not in it, but how do we help people, uh, uh, young people, and o really old people stay in their homes? I mean, uh, um, we, like the 80s, I mean, it, building the cheapest house possible is sometimes the most expensive one to, to uh, run to, to the energy and stuff. And, mm -hmm. and 
the, the, the problem we had before is they, even if you built the house to code and you turned around and air conditioned it, uh, the condensation in places would, would uh, uh, cause black mold and, and rot that you, um, and the, uh, the, you know, we don't want to go back there. Well, correct. I guess, you know, I say in the 90s when we, and, and 2000s when we made everything so tight, but then didn't, didn't have an air exchange unit in the house, you had black mold all over it. I mean, in the window industry, you'd come in and it would be a mess. But now you've got to run electricity constantly to, to run that air exchange. You've got to bring the cold air in, heat it up, but, exchange but, it. But that's a, 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 a I'm sorry, a, a tight house does not cause black mold. Moisture causes black mold. And, and so it's not, it's not the, how the tightness of the house, it's, it's other factors well, the you, way it's you built. You put off a quart of water just sleeping at night in your bedroom. And if you have no way to exchange that air, you've got mold on your windows. No, that, oh, you've got condensation on Which your Which turns wind. to mold. So, um, oh, I don't want to get into a huge what, what it is. Are we having it's, questions it's, it's and it's answers or are we having a debate? Direction? I, I'd like to try and take advantage of Chris here. So if we have questions for Chris, um, we can debate this after the fact. Um, so do you have something for Chris, Steve? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm curious from Chris's point of view, uh, it is a problem uh, making houses so they're not only uh, uh, cheap to buy, but they're, they're reasonable to operate. And, and, and how, how do we do that? Um, well, I, I actually happen to agree with you that you know, we don't buy houses with cash in this country. We buy them with, with a mortgage. Um, so the upfront cost is the down payment. But after that, then it's the combined cost of your financing and your energy bill that's going to determine is how affordable that it is to live in that house. And the high efficiency homes pan out that way. So your monthly bills are lower um, with the high efficiency homes. So when, you, when you're talking about pricing people out, what you really are talking about is that down payment. Um, but beyond that, it is, it is um, more affordable to li That's why, you know, Habitat for ha Humanity and other low-income house housing um, uh, or agencies, they built high-efficiency homes because they want the operating costs for their, in, uh, for their tenants to be low. Um, so, you know, that, so I, I agree with you there that it's, it's you know, it's, it's short-sighted to build a cheap house up front. Correct. But, yep. Yeah. So, um, but there, there almost is no affordable house to build right now. I mean, they're just, it is yeah. so expensive. So I would, and for that, I would respond back that there's a lot of reasons that, that houses have gotten expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not just the codes. I agree. Um, yeah. But, but right. that on top of it, or forcing, a, you know, wiring and forcing the, the you know, the, eight, the uh, solar on it. And, right. I mean, just, I think, it, I have the issue with the forcing. I think incentivizing, but but demanding that somebody follow uh, the government's rule is a little bit, you know, against my grain. That's, okay. it, that's all. Yeah, right. I so mean, um, that's what we have a, code yeah. does. We have somebody <laughs> on. We have somebody. Wait, yeah, we have somebody on the audience with their hand up. Chris Harris. Actually, I didn't have my hand up, but oh. I will comment. Oh, um, the, it's, it's a complex uh, situation. Yeah. Sorry. It's a very complex situation because Trevor highlighted things and Mason uh, has highlighted things. And one thing he highlighted, which is very important, is the life cycle cost of any capital investment. Of the whole is a capital investment. And so um, we always look in business at you know the upfront cost and then the operating cost and then we discount everything and um, and lo and behold Mr. Mason is probably correct in the end the owner and the occupant of the home probably saves cash and 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 there's a return on it but it's hard up front it's hard to get started like Trevor said. And so if there's incentives out there to get started at the front end, that makes a difference. But that's all I'll say. Okay, um, great. And just I'm just going to give a 10-minute warning. So uh, we have a hearing that has to start at 645. So um, now I will uh, – did you have a comment, David? Or 
Yeah. To, I'll try to be quick. Yeah. <laughs> Please identify uh, yourself. I have talked with Trevor. Please Cuddy. identify oh, yourself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm David Gilbert Keith, chair of the Energy Committee. And I have had conversations with Trevor that were very constructive. I, you know, we don't want to be obstructionist to development in Deerfield. Um, personally, I have a quick anecdote that may pertain to what Steve was saying and Chris is saying. I used to be on the Board of Health in Sunderland for many years. And it's notoriously a thankless job, but the one time I did get thanked was when I had enforced the um, septic code to say this system isn't good enough before someone moved in. Mm -hmm. And it probably raised the price of their home, but they didn't get socked with a $50,000 failure, which their neighbors did. So I think there's a value, as Chris is saying, in, in preparing for what will eventually happen if you're, if you're installing old technology, you know, the fossil technology, it's probably a safe bet that before the life term of the home, that stuff is going to go away, whether just by economics, because it's been replaced by better efficiency. But all that said, I also wonder, Chris, if you can address, I, there has been recent publicity about a bill that did pass about um, giving, it's $20 million of state aid for low income, particularly um, upfront money mm -hmm. to, to initiate some energy things. It's the climate, uh, what is it, bank. Yeah, the Green you bank. shared that with me and thank you for that. Yeah. The Green Bank? The Green Bank, yeah. I'm not familiar enough with it to, to comment on it. Because I feel like that's, I mean, I'm, I'm for the technology and the movement. I, I think that was great that you shared that with me because mm. that, that was my concern about not, you know, just putting up that roadblock to getting people to, to build and, um, and if we can lower the upfront cost. Because I agree, long term, it makes sense to have an energy efficient home and you're burning less fuels, it's better. It's better all around. I just have, I have trouble just uh, forcing that. Uh, I, I want the marketplace to do that with incentives and people wanting to do that versus the government telling them what they must do. So, so um, now we have another comment from Julie, who does have her hand up. <laughs> it's, it's not the cursor not this way. time. Hey, I just have a quick question. Um, is there any provision for solar thermal, um, solar hot water in the code? There's, there's no provision for it, but if you had, um, if you have a, you know, solar thermal, solar hot water, that would be a non-combusting um, appliance. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I know there's one gentleman out in Western Mass who has a house that is completely heated by solar thermal. Mm. Um, there's a lot of, lot of solar thermal. Uh, and he was concerned uh, about the specialized code to see what kind of effect it would have. He's very comfortable with it at the moment. Um, so, uh, it, it would just be a, basically, you would call it an electric heating system of some kind, heating hot water, because you're going to use electricity to run the pumps. Other than that, you're just getting your heat. Yeah, because the thermodynamics for solar, um, solar hot water are way better than um, PV. Yes. So, it makes the the sense to, to right. yeah. include that in the mix. Mm -hmm. Right about that. Maybe you know how it gets. Great. Um, all right, we've got time for maybe two more comments. So, um, yes, uh, please step up and identify yourself. Good evening. Uh, my name is M.A. Swedland, and I am on the Energy Committee. Um, there are two incentivizing programs right now that the state has just started up. One is called the Climate Bank, and it's, it's placed within the housing um, infrastructure of the uh, state. And it focuses on providing uh, low, in, uh, low interest and no interest loans to people who the group that you're talking about, mm -hmm. not the ones who are building the houses and putting in the three 
three right. uh, panel windows and all yep. that stuff. Um, and then there's also another program which is called the Energy Home Loan. Do you remember what it's called, David? But there's another program. I can get you information on that because that's all about incentivizing mm -hmm. um, and making it possible for people who can't afford these additional costs to, to be able to do it. Also, <clears throat> as far as putting solar on the roof because you have a um, dual fuel house, you've chosen to do that rather than all electric. Um, you can get one of these third party, and there are good ones around, third party com uh, companies to put solar on your roof at no cost. And, um, and so that also can be done with at no additional cost. Okay, and there's one more. Uh, are you finished, Emmy? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to you, assume that you were done. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I am, I'm sure, I'm done. We'll talk further. Of yeah. course. Thank you. Um, yes, Lori. Lori. Laurie Busada, North Main Street. So Chris, I know that Ashfield um, just passed all three of those vehicle, um, zero electric vehicle first policy, the carbon decarbonization roadmap and the specialized dress code at their last meeting. And I know that Northampton and Amherst have had the specialized dress code for a few months now. Mm -hmm. Are there other Western Mass towns at all that you could tell us about? That have passed it? Yeah, no. or working on it. Working on it. Oh, I didn't come, let's see, uh, Western Mass. Um, oh, jeez, I had my list, yes, there is, there's like a half a dozen. Um, Windsor, um, <laughs> I'm drawing there's a blank There's 41 here. communities, are they mostly out east, and why is that? That's a good question, um, but I will say that w what I've seen happen is when the specialized code became available, there were a bunch of communities out east, northeast in particular, that really just adopted it very quickly. Whereas I would bring it up at a meeting out here and people said, we want to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then the Climate Leaders Communities program came out as a possibility. And communities seemed, in Western Mass, it seemed to be, that seemed to be the driving force. It's like the communities out here said, well, we're, we're trying to do a lot with our buildings. And this is a way to get a lot more money and a lot more support from the state. Um, that decarbonization roadmap, there's a grant opportunity to, uh, a grant of services to help towns actually develop a, that, that roadmap, um, uh, for example, and, and the larger grants that are going to be available. And they looked at it and they said, well, specialized code is not that big of a step up. And the rest of these things, a lot of us already have it, such as Deerfield. You've got your team, you, you've got your, meet, mm -hmm. your, your, uh, your, your, your green, green communities, green standing. You've got your energy committee uh, to mm -hmm. help you out. Um, uh, and they looked at it and they say, well, this isn't that big of a lift, let's do this. This is where we want to go. So, it, it, so it's like the Western Mass is coming along slower, but there are a lot of communities that are following the same path. They're interested in climate leaders' communities, and part of that is a specialized code, and they're bringing it up. We'll see how they are. I haven't anybody, you know, bring it up and, and fail yet, but... <laughs> so, so I just wanted to add that since this is the direction that we're moving as a, as a country and as, as a world, the advantage of us acting on it sooner is that that money for maybe solar on the frontier roof or on the DPW roof or in geothermal for the town campus, you know, it will still be a little ways down the road if we were to adopt this at fall town meeting. It still wouldn't be until maybe the following spring that we got to apply for it. I don't know, but it gives us a possibility for these projects that are staring us in the face, that our energy audit that we just did from the, on the municipal buildings pointed to. So, you know, I just remember talking about the um, Okay, we need to wrap it up. I, I don't mean to cut you off, but we have a 645, so can you finish your thought? I, I'm finishing that, you know, um, the EV charging station seemed really ridiculous in the beginning, and actually we were in there before all the rules made sense, and now they make a whole lot more sense with their changing the um, fee structure. But, you know, now we've got a whole bunch more in there. So I just think getting in early with the this, this slight um, additions that the specialized code will require and make us avail, you know, eligible for a lot more money from the state and all the incentives are available now. So that's why the Energy Committee is really excited about the possibility. Thanks. Thank you. 
Thank you, and um, thank you, Chris, for coming you, Chris. and making the presentation for us. Um, You're welcome. Appreciate it. And we sure. will yeah. certainly have a lot to think about. So I hope I helped. You did. You did. Thank you very much. All right. So the next um, item on the agenda is uh, an application for new wines and malt beverages license from Primo Pizzeria and Restaurant, Inc. at 4B Sugarloaf Street. Uh, someone here representing... Please come up and uh, join us at the table here so you can speak into the mic. And, uh, read this? Please. Okay. So, uh, Town of Deerfield Select Board Board of Health notice a public hearing pursuant to General Law Chapter 138, Section 12, the Deerfield General Bylaws Chapter 247, the Deerfield Select Board Board of Health uh, as local licensing authority will hold a public hearing on May 15, 2024 at 6.45 p.m. on the application for new wines and malts beverage license at 4B Sugarloaf Street, South Deerfield, Mass., uh, from Primo Pizzeria and Restaurant, Inc. Documents are on file for public review at the municipal offices during regular office hours and on the town's website at www.deerfieldma.us. Meetings are being held in a hybrid fashion with the opportunity for both in-person um, and remote participation. For purposes of in-person attendance, the Town of Deerfield will host the meeting, main meeting room at the Deerfield Municipal Offices, 8 Conway Street, South Deerfield, Mass, 01373. Remote participation is noted on the, um, on the hearing notice. Uh, the toll-free number, if you'd like to call in, is 833-833. 5480276 and there is a link on there for the Zoom meeting which is up and live. And I believe it's the same as our as our regular meeting. So so welcome. How are you? So Good. could you please identify yourself for the audience and uh, and then tell us a little bit about what you're hoping to achieve and please speak into the mic. Okay. Yes, yes, please. sure, please. please. Hi, um, my name is Oscar Rodas. Hi, um, I'm the new owner of Primo Restaurant and Pizzeria. So, we are the new faces here, you know, trying to help people, our customers, our community with, you know, serving food. So, wonderful. Yeah. Welcome, to, welcome to Deerfield. We're happy to have you. Very much. Um, so, you're you're looking for a, a wine and malt license, correct? Yes. Um, and is there, does the board have any questions as far as? Uh, One thing I wanted to clarify, and I'll ask Casey to do this, I, I understand that we have a certain number of beer and wine, yes. and we have a certain number of all alcohol licenses, and um, could you just explain where we are in the process, because I think we have another another applicant for a beer and wine license so I just want to so so yes we have uh, a certain number of wine and malt liquor licenses so it's on-premise serving which is what you applied for yeah. we also have a certain number and this is a quota that's provided by the state um, we also have all alcoholic ones right now there is one license um, there was one license available for wine and malt um, the board had approved a license before you came in with your application. It's at the ABCC right now. Um, so we're waiting for the ABCC to make a decision about that license. However, your application came in, we have to go through the process. Um, so our, the way we understand it, our quota for all alcoholic, mm -hmm. we have more licenses available than we do for wine and malt. Right. So we wanted you and this was a question that i think had come up but we didn't have a, a an answer except that we have availability for licenses for all alcoholic whereas we're still waiting for the abcc to make a decision on this previous wine and malt if the previous one doesn't go through there'd be a license for wine and malt if you wanted to change your application for an all liquor license that we have that, so the that state only have. gives us so many, right? And we had a, one that was just kind of pending; no one was using. They have, they applied a few weeks ago for right. that, so that's out at the out of the state, kind of saying they're they're looking at the business, deciding whether they'll grant that license. Um, 
but we do have a little bit more capacity in the all liquor license. So if you if you wanted to, you know, you could wait and see what we what transpires, wait. or you could change your application for for all alcohol. There's something to think about as you you know as you. We didn't really realize this, I guess, until your application came in, how close we were. So um, you're welcome. You know, we'll obviously hold the hearing, all of that, but it, and then you could, when you leave, um, obviously we can't make a decision tonight, but because we don't have the license to, to give, but um, you could decide, you know, whether you'd want to come back for an all liquor license, um, okay. which would encompass, obviously, we're, you know, Beer and wine and malt. Wine and, wine malt. and malt. Yeah, it would be, it would be more everything. than that. So it's it allows you to serve a wider range of beverages. That's yeah. I do believe there was some question, um, and I think I heard Pat ask you this question. If you don't mind, Mr. Chair, you have your are you getting your tips certification? I had it. I have. Can I tell you some of my? Um, yeah, go ahead. Been working in the uh, restaurants mm -hmm. for like the last 15, 16 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. I had my tip certification in the last 14 years. Yep. Funny, my expired last year. Yep. But we just waiting, you know, to hear like if we're gonna be able to get like yeah. you know to like get the the, um, the certification for the whole staff. Yeah, we definitely want to see easy that. It's better to do the whole group at once. Than of course. Get it myself or renew my right. certification. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Everything is just we waiting to hear, you know, mm -hmm. the decision. Yeah. I do have, you know, I, I do know. The you know about it. Yeah, it's super important to us, and we really want to make sure everybody is trained with yeah. that. So, um, Casey, if you um, could give us our options about um, what we could do tonight and whether we could continue the hearing, whether mm -hmm. we could, um, you know, what are our options? So my suggestion, and I'm no expert, but and I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but my suggestion is perhaps the board could continue the hearing and then we can consult with town council mm -hmm. and also with the ABCC to see where they are with that previous license approval. And what happens when that when there is a continuance it means that the board doesn't make a decision right now they continue the hearing to another date and time and you would come back at that time and they would continue to go through the question and answers that they have for the license application um, which revolves around you know the tips questions the space mm -hmm. question that sort of thing um, that would be my thought mr. chair um, that would give me some time to see if folks in the office could reach out to the ABCC and we could also reach out to town council. Um, it and does, it doesn't stop this process. It just extends it slightly longer. And it allows you some time to think about the all, all liquor thing, which is certainly easier for us to, you know, if we, that we have when we could, you know, if, if everything passed, we could extend where the other one, we might have our hands tied for a while. Like, yeah, um, I was just, uh, you, were in, you are in the industry, or have been in the industry for the last 14 years? Yes. Was it in this area specifically, or were you I some... Uh, Amherst, Northampton, West Pico, I worked 10 years with Bueno Isano. Oh, yeah. You know, the last four years with Bueno Isano, I worked at the new store, West Pico. You know, that's mm -hmm. the only store <coughs> that has a uh, beer. Yep. So I was when they opened that one. I was the one, you know, there and you know dealing with that kind of stuff. That's yeah. I, you know, mm -hmm. I got the certifications and all that. I worked at Esalen Cafe too. You know, so nice. You have a, you have a broad experience as far as in the restaurant business itself and with serving alcohol. Yes. You know, I had I've been like doing catering too. You know, like mm -hmm. cooking, serving alcohol. And that, yep. I know. Thank you. That kind so it, um, it's town meeting season, and so one of the things we're struggling with is that um, availability to, to talk to our lawyers is limited. So I think they're going to free up in about two weeks. I think so. so I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to, no, I was going to actually make a suggestion that in order to get with the ABCC and find out what they're doing about the previous applicant, and also to give us time to talk to our lawyer after the season is over, 
maybe we do this, we, we pick a date a month from now to come back, continue the hearing for a month. Um, be, by that time, we should have answers we need. Um, and that would, um, you know, keep this process running. We know that you're interested, um, but it would give us time to actually have some information. And maybe by then the ABCC will have decided that, you know, the, the applicant is not going to get the license or, you know, in which case it becomes a moot question and then we proceed with your application. Does that seem like something you're willing to consider? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So would we need to pick a date certain. Would the 12th, uh, so your next meeting is the 29th. The first meeting in June is the 12th. So it's not quite a month. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so would you be available to come? On June 12th at the same time? Is, uh, what day is it's it? a Wednesday. 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 Yeah. It's same a Wednesday. Same as tonight. It, yeah. They meet every two, every other Wednesday. So, in order to give us enough time to get a better answer on some of the questions the board has, if we could continue the meeting to the twelfth at the same time, so June twelfth um, at six forty-five, that would hopefully give us all a chance to come back to the table with better information. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Okay. So I, I'd, I'd entertain a motion to continue. I'll make a motion to continue the hearing till um, June twelfth at six forty-five p.m. I second it. Thank you. Wait. Any further discussion? Nope. Hearing none. Uh, all those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Thank you Thank very you. much. And welcome, welcome to, to Deerfield. <laughs> We're very happy to have you. It was there the other night. It was wonderful. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, now, um, we're a little... Christopher Dunn, are you here? There we are. He is. So now we're going to hear from Christopher Dunn, uh, the Planning and Economic Development uh, Coordinator, for updates on projects he's working on. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so a couple of projects to provide updates on. Uh, first one is the uh, Network Geothermal Feasibility Study. Uh, just as a reminder, this is through a, a grant from the organization HEAT uh, that uh, you know, we got back in um, early January, I believe. Um, so basically the idea is to look at the feasibility of having some kind of network geothermal system, uh, not only on the town campus, but also potentially connecting to businesses surrounding the campus. Um, reached out to a firm that has worked closely with HEAT in the past, Bureau Happel, a, a large global engineering firm. They do these feasibility studies. Um, so they are they are available and they provide a scope of work, which I, I believe you have a copy of. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, the idea is three different iterations of a, a network system. Um, and it's kind of just way of background, uh, these network geothermal systems. You know, the difference between this and, you know, just doing geothermal to one home is this makes use potentially the right of ways that the that the existing gas company has, um, you know, as a way to kind of make sure that the utility is on board with the process. Um, and then it would look at, you know, not only the campus, but also a second iteration uh, that goes out further and looks at, you know, connecting to STEMs and the schools. And then uh, beyond that, maybe even connecting up to Treehouse and to Pelican critically. Um, so this is, you know, just a feasibility study. It's $50,000 uh, funded by that grant. Um, so what you've got before you is, uh, I believe, a draft um, contract and the scope. And then uh, I would just mention that I also ran this by the Energy Committee last week. Uh, and they were on board. They were going to let me know if they had any questions. I haven't heard anything from them yet, but certainly I'll include their comments if you hear anything. And one last thing I'd mention is we are looking for, um, you know, potential residents who would be willing to sit down with the consultant and, and kind of talk to them them about their interest in the project or their interest in geothermal in general for their home. Um, they're certainly looking for, for champions for this kind of work. Um, so I, I, I volunteered at least one member of the Energy Committee for that. Um, but certainly <laughs> if anyone else we can think of, um, they would, that would be great to have as well. Okay. So um, Chris and or Casey, um, do we need to take any action on uh, on this signing anything tonight? It's not 
town money, right? It's grant money. Yeah, it's, it's grant money. That. We've already yeah. we've already reached a contract with mm -hmm. um, Heat, who is the people who are paying for this, and now we are looking at hiring this engineering firm who does this um, as part of their business practice to, you know proceed with talking with Berkshire Brewing Company, et cetera, and uh, the surrounding area doing GIS searches, doing engineering uh, studies to determine whether this is a good location, and then to develop sort of a, a possible plan if, if we were to find funding to do this sometime in the future. Um, as you mentioned, too, I believe that the state is trying to encourage large utilities like Berkshire Gas and Eversource and National Grid to develop systems like this to replace, well, particularly gas companies, to replace um, gas pipeline infrastructure with geothermal systems that could serve a similar function in people's homes. So um, the, what, what do we need to do, Casey? I think it's in is our, motion. is our terms and conditions okay? I mean, I, sometimes, you know, council always needs to look at that. Usually but. council, normally what I would do is suggest that pending um, review and approval by council, the board. Yep. Okay. Consider authorizing a signatory on the contract. Yeah, so I'm just having trouble with my suggested <laughs> motion. Right here. Good. Yep. So that's, uh, what, I, what, that's what I was getting okay. at. Okay, yes. What's the uh, motion, motion to approve the contract with uh, Bureau Happold Consulting Engineers PC in the amount of 50000 for their March 29, 2024 proposal, Deerfield Network Geothermal Feasibility Study, Energy and Geothermal Consulting Services Proposal. Uh, that's so the moved. motion? That's the motion. That's the motion. Um, I'm for purpose of discussion, I'll second the motion. And then, I, Blake, if you have questions that you want to ask in, in discussion. Um, actually, that, uh, in Again, because I'm not familiar with this. Sure. Um, Please. What What are we? We've already we're already in agreement with these people at this time, correct? With yes. Heat, not with okay. these this entity, but Heat had given us a, a grant to okay. go and do this study. So not town money, somebody right. else's. And this is just for us to come up with the idea that it, if does it, it works. Work. Does that it work? Is okay. it cost effective? Yeah. Are our businesses interested? Are, are would it work for our municipality? You know, just and to see if it's the, something we can do. Are they just doing the area of the center of town, or are they going to go out and start going to the outside? Christopher, I, I basically think it's feasibility, but um, since a lot of yeah, so it's it's uh, in terms of the geography. So there's three iterations of the network they're looking at. There's one version where the network is just the kind of town campus here as well as the surrounding downtown. There's a second version that includes that plus the schools and stems. And then there's a third version that goes even further north and includes Treehouse and Pelican. So those are the, that's kind of as far out as they're looking. Mm -hmm. And you were saying something about uh, residents being notified of this as well. Is that part of that main unit or is that something that's separate where they would be, if they had the land with their residence, they could actually have them take a look at that too to see if that's feasible or is it just for the town government? Yeah, so the they will be looking at, as I understand it, they'll be looking at um, uh, energy requirements for, for all buildings in the area that they can get uh, information on. Um, so they'll be, I believe that'll include residences to the extent that they can get that information from, from Berkshire Gas or Eversource. Um, but uh, certainly, you know, the driver here is the municipal buildings, but also big energy users like Berkshire Gas, I mean, uh, Berkshire Brewing, Treehouse, Pelican, um, those kind of entities. Okay. So this geothermal feasibility study is just gives us a baseline of what south what the possibilities are in south deerfield um, and it doesn't commit us to doing anything in the future but it would provide um, at least a 2024 baseline of what seems to be possible should some future board or private entity want to do this Right, and one, one last thing I would just mention really quick, you know, a lot of this work is based off of 
Um, Eversource undertaking a pilot program for this in Framingham. Mm -hmm. um, so they are doing their own network geothermal program in Framingham now. Um, and so this grant program that he put forward is basically to try to find other opportunities to, you know, to make these systems a reality. Yep. So we, um, there's no, no public input at this point. We've got a motion on the table. Right. So, um, so is there any further questions? No, I'm good. Okay. So, uh, without uh, any further discussion, I'll, um, all those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Thank you. So now you've got some more stuff to report on? Uh, yeah, real quick, uh, so the bid results came in last week for the North Main Street uh, pedestrian improvements project, i.e. the sidewalks, and uh, the shared streets and spaces grant as well. Um, so just as a reminder, um, the area we were looking at for the sidewalks was North Main Street um, on the east side, basically all the way up to Jackson Road, and then on the, the west side, really just a short distance up to the high school from Pleasant Street. Um, and then the shared streets was two kind of crosswalk locations with rapid flashing beacons. One of those was at Pleasant Street, and another one of those was at Caliber Drive, both crossing North Main Street. Um, two firms bid on, on those projects, uh, Taylor Davis and um, Davenport Trucking. Uh, Davenport Trucking was the low bid on the, uh, excuse me, on the sidewalk project. Um, their bid came in at 159,000, so well within budget, uh, so that was fortunate. And then uh, Taylor Davis um, just slightly underbid Davenport on the shared streets. Their bid was 91,000. That was a shared streets and spaces grant um, of 113,000, so they came in at 91. We've certainly got a little bit of money to do the traffic control, contingency, etc. so we're in good shape on that one as well. So let me know if we have any questions. I think we're Hoping to get a, a notice of uh, award at least tonight. Um, in case you have Turner, did I provide contracts? I'm trying to remember now. It would have. You did provide them in the uh, RFP. So what? It, during the last time we had one of these, Christopher. Um, what I asked the board to do was consider the notice of award for the price of the lowest bidder, and then consider. Um, the sending out the contract and having the board approve that contract contingent upon the negotiation and any changes to count that council might make. I know I saw it somewhere and I don't see it now. What are you looking for? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I answered him without asking you. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Please. Uh... <laughs> fine. I was just looking for the um, the bits because I know I read it already. What? I'm like. The, uh, the, the bids, I guess, uh, with the amount. If, if you want me to pull them up on my screen, I can do that also. Um, yeah, why don't you share? Yeah, and there, I, saw I know. They, I don't uh, have a full copy of your warrant. Meantime, you. Casey, I, I want your guidance on what, what we need to Found do oh. <laughs> for each of these things. Yeah. There are two different bids, right? Yep. So, so for, from what he said, I looked, I reviewed what Christopher had sent over. Um, Taylor Davis is the lowest responsive and responsible bidder according to what the breakdown I saw Christopher give us, correct, mm -hmm. Christopher? Yep. yep. My recommendation would be to award, and I think you just, that's it. Yeah, so that's this, it. this is the shared streets one uh, where Taylor Davis yep. is the low bid. Is the then, low bid. And then the other one is um, Clayton Davenport. So Clayton Davenport was the low bid for the sidewalks. sidewalks. Yeah. And so what you want to do is award the sidewalk bid to Clayton to Clayton Davenport. Was there any were there any uh, bid alternatives or anything in that sidewalk? Did, Christopher, I don't think you had flat, bid alternatives. There was right? no alternatives in that that sidewalk bid, correct? No, uh, Andrea Woods from Burkhog ended up structuring it so that we could kind of, if it turned out we really couldn't do the full length of Jackson Road, yep. all the bidders would be aware that there was going to be kind of a prioritization process for how far we could go. Right. Um, but in the end, obviously, you know, we, they came in well under budget, so yeah. we're good. That's great. I just wanted to make sure um, 
and we laid out the consistency of the material, right? It's, I know that around uh, streets we have, we have uh, cement, uh, concrete, and then uh, with the, you know, with the pads and the all ramps, that. Yeah. yeah, the ramps, and then um, we're doing asphalt on the long stretches. Correct, yep, and it's a, uh, I believe Kevin ended up going with what's called a Cape Cod berm um, yep. for the curbs. Yep. Um, Great. I can I can provide other details. If, no, if I think that's good. I remember. Yeah, I all of I this was in the RFP, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The specs. Yep. The, it's all according to the specs. Yep. And is this one of the things, Chris, that you prepared a, a motion for us? I don't think so. I, I don't think there's a motion. No, for I, I didn't see that there were uh, okay. notices of award ready to go out tonight, okay. but um, so, so, I, so that's not included in the motions packet. But I, I can make um, one. I can make okay. one for you. No, it's yeah. all right. I got it. Um, so I'll make a motion to award the shared streets um, and spaces um, IFB 2024-2128 uh, from May 7th, 2024 at 3 p.m. to Taylor Davis Landscape and Construction, P.O. Box 507, Amherst, Mass. 01002 in the amount of 91000 Six hundred and forty-eight dollars and ten cents. And do we need to authorize anyone to talk to them? So, what you want to do? The notice of award is first. So okay. that yep. motion is so first. I'll make second. I'll second the motion. Any further discussion? Okay. Hearing none. All those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. And then I would uh, make a second motion to uh, to enter into. To enter to provide the contract to the contractor right. and authorize the wait a minute this is why those motions are good Chris because <laughs> I, I would have sat back and thought about this if I had, yeah. if I had had a second to think well, about it um, so so the town yeah. administrator I would have yeah. Christopher reach out with the contract documents right. but pending review of council mm -hmm. I think you could Authorize that that negotiation start. Correct. So make a motion that um, that we reach out with the contract right. pending um, legal's approval. We start the uh, start the negotiation, negotiation process. Do you want to authorize an official? And I authorize the town administrator to sign. Okay, that's based my on question. That award amount. So that's my motion. Let me make this better. What amount is it? Uh, it's the, the same amount, the one okay. that the ninety-one thousand. So this is the same project. It's okay. the same project. Yep. Very good. So I'll yep. second that. All right. Any discussion? Any anybody confused at this point? <laughs> all right. Welcome it's a two to step all of process. Us. All right. So um, all those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Sounds Tim Hilchey, aye. All right. So, so we're done with the sidewalks. Yeah, I mean, no, the, the, the shared streets. Shared, shared streets, streets with so sidewalks. Second one. Uh, all right. So I'll make a motion to up. Uh, uh, Approve the notice of award uh, for the South Deerfield sidewalk replacement IFB 2024-2127 for May 7th, 2024 at 2 p.m. to Clayton D. Davenport Trucking, 130 Coleraine Street, Greenfield, Mass, uh, 01301 in the amount of 159655 Is there a second? I'll second that. All right. So, for discussion, anybody have questions about this, this work? Hearing none, um, all those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Helchey, aye. And yes, I'm glad that it came in well under bid. Yeah. That's a, always a good thing. I will also make a motion to um, proceed with the um, contract, contract and providing that uh, general counsel is um, Okay, with the contract, proceed to contract and uh, uh, authorize the town administrator to sign. Second. Any discussion? No discussion. Okay. All those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Excellent. We're going to get some sidelines. Yay. Um, and then you have yet more things, Christopher? You have yeah, letters. Uh, last couple things just have to do with the one stop for community growth. Um, so we're the community one stop for growth rather. Uh, so first on there is uh, the town of Deerfield's potential application uh, to that funding source. Um, you know, I've been working with Trevor and, and DPC 
uh, on a project to look at hooking up with Deerfield or with Waitley uh, in terms of our wastewater treatment system um, as well as a part of our road system. Uh, this has obviously been a kind of long discussed um, project. Um, I'm pleased to say that Waitley has their select board has already signed a letter of support for the grant application. Um, DEDIC had a, a spirited discussion uh, last week about it and ultimately voted in favor of, um, you know, supporting and going forward with the grant application as well. Great. Um, and what you have before you tonight is just a letter of support from the select board for that application and then uh, the process from here would be getting the, the application together and submitting uh, by June 5th of 2024. Sounds great. I'd make a motion to the chair to uh, approve the letter of support um, for the Deerfield Waitley Road and Wastewater Connections funding application. Um, yeah, I won't read the whole thing. All right, and I'd second that. So, is there any other information that we need from Christopher? Uh, yeah, break this down a little bit for us, Christopher. <laughs> I was yeah, sure. Uh, you want me to share my screen really quick and just kind of sure. give you a map so you can sure take a look at it there. All right, give me one moment here. Um, as I, you know, as I mentioned, this has been discussed for a long time. Um, you know, I'll start with the the road portion of it. Uh, let me just share this really quick. All right. And just so you, you can visualize it really quick, what you're seeing on your screen, that purple portion there is uh, yep. the, the Deerfield Industrial Park. Um, and then I'll turn that off really quick, but that's where the industrial park is. Mm -hmm. um, so with respect to the road, uh, I hope you're all able to see this okay. Um, here's Deerfield Industrial Park uh, Drive West. And then here's Waitley's Industrial Park just south of ours. Yep. Uh, there's this one parcel that has never been developed, um, it was specifically in DDIC's master plan reserved for a potential connection to Waitley. Um, so whether or not to move forward with that has been a, a point of discussion uh, over the years. And I know most recently we had some folks from Waitley reach out about it again. Um, we think it's at least worth studying and um, BHB provided a um, quote for a traffic study um, just to look at, you know, what would happen if you reconnected it, um, you know, what would be the impact on tenants in DDIC, uh, what would be the, uh, you know, potential benefits for residents up here who currently, uh, both on the Waitley and Deerfield side, face truck traffic from Waitley's Industrial Park. And then what, if any, changes would you need to potentially make to uh, 116? And on that front, I've reached out to MassDOT just to let them know, hey, we are looking at this study and we'll certainly loop you into whatever the results are. Um, so that's the road portion of the study. Uh, right. Any questions on that? No. Well, okay, the, the only thing oh. is, is that on the, the, the road study itself, if it were to come up that there would need to be lights or anything else at that intersection, who would absorb the cost for that? Is that, was that, I know that was part of the discussion with Dita. Yeah, I think I think that would have to be a, a discussion at that point. Um, you know, from from my perspective, the road certainly um, you know benefits those Waitley businesses more than it does the Deerfield Industrial Park. Right. Um, I, on the other hand, you know, as I think somebody on the, the DA board pointed out, this is really about regional economic development. You know, jobs don't really stop at a town line. Line. You can right. <laughs> you know you can commute from Deerfield to Waitley. So. Uh, we are all in this together, but that's uh, yeah certainly a consideration. But see, seeing um, it's a state road, you know, if if the state feels that improvements need to be made, the state will will fund that. I mean, oh yes, yeah, sure for yeah. one one sixteen. Yeah. Right, <sighs> correct. Yeah. So that that is the uh, road portion of that study, and then um, you know over this way, of course, is our uh, wastewater treatment plant. Um, I don't think this even does it justice anymore. <laughs> Trevor, I'm probably it's probably right. looking a little bit different. <laughs> it's a lot different now. <laughs> at this point, after $22 yep. million dollars in upgrades. Yep. Um, so it's also been discussed, you know, whether or not we can kind of connect to uh, Waitley and even Sunderland potentially. Um, we, as, you know, we have some additional capacity at this point, um, and it would be great to be able to spread out the cost of our system uh, to those additional users, if, if that makes sense. Um, and to that end, uh, DPC has put together a draft scope. You may have a copy before you tonight. Um, 
but they are going to be getting a more detailed version to us soon. Um, and the idea is to look at not, not only um, you know whether or not um, it makes sense from a, a physical standpoint, you know whether or not those connections can be made cost effectively, but also what's the framework for how that happens. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is there some kind of buy-in cost for Waitley? Um, I, I'll tell you that they are interested in connecting to our system not only because of their industrial park right here, um, but they are also in the process of trying to, they're studying redeveloping kind of the area around exit 35, and so certainly if they had, you know, a wastewater connection there, that would really lower the bar for development, so they're interested on that front as well. So. So a couple of potential win-wins here. Um, you know, the, I will just say that the funding source we're most likely to get is the uh, Rural Development Fund, which is uh, within that one state, one stop for growth. Um, and that has, I believe, for one community, usually a, uh, you know, a max uh, of, I think, 100,000 for, for non-infrastructure projects. Um, in this case, because it's multiple communities, we could probably go a little bit above that, but I don't think the the scopes of work are going to require that anyway. So, yes. any uh, any other questions on these? No, I don't. Um, <clears throat> what you were talking about was expanding beyond the industrial park to uh, now. Is that crossing back over one sixteen? Is that going back towards the center of South Deerfield where you where you're showing this? Correct. Yep. Yep. So that would mean that we could also connect existing. Um, residents in the town of South Deerfield with that that may not be hooked up to that, or is that, are they already they already, already hooked are. up? I think all yeah, of they, that is already because the main trunk okay. comes right down at that intersection, so there most of South Deerfield is already on sewer. I don't know if anybody is not. I could be wrong about that, but I'm almost positive that everyone in South Deerfield is, but nobody in Waitley. Well, obviously. I think the um, beyond the uh, dry bridge. Those homes are still on septic. Correct on uh, north, north, yeah. yeah, north, because the yeah. I don't know they ran out of money back in the '40s or something when they were putting the thing in, or I forget when they put the lines in, they hit ledge or I don't know. Some, somehow they stopped running sewer further up North Main. So, Chris, the other thing question I have on this is that if you were to have to replace the piping from the sewer plant up to the uh, Dedic land and then over to Waitley, who would be responsible for that? Because how old is that piping? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, fortunately, I believe DPC is doing some of that asset management work now. Yeah. Um, I know we have, at the very least, they already did, I believe, some sonar work. So we have a sense of, you know, what portions of that pipe, which by the way, you know, at least in this neighborhood, kind of runs along with this stream and then actually does cross into Waitley already and then kind of juts back up and, you know, heads back to 116 and down to the treatment plant that way. Um, but we already have some information on what state that's in. Um, again, I think, you know, a lot of this is going to be kind of a, a, a discussion and a negotiation. Um, you know, the good news for us is we already have the wastewater treatment plan and the collection system. So, yeah, um, they at least from a negotiation in. standpoint, that's a positive. But, you know, we're, we're both in this together and we're, again, trying to do some regional economic development here. All right. So, again, we're not talking about them with this particular letter of them buying in at this Correct. point. It's just basically the fact that we're pursuing it. Yeah. Or we're letting them right. pursue it. Seeing, I guess. seeing if, it's, yeah. if it's feasible, what it would cost, okay. that kind of thing. How it would reduce the, uh, the sewer user fees for the Deerfield residents. <clears throat> So, do. so just need a. Uh, I, I thought. Did I make a motion? I think you made a motion. I thought I made a motion and we seconded. But right. We just yep. need to vote it. Yeah. Yeah. The letter. Sir, is there any other discussion? No. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, seeing that there's no other discussion, uh, I'll take them. All those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Great. Okay. Two more letters of support. Yep. Yeah, and these are also for the One Stop for Growth. Uh, so these are two private projects. They're, they'll be familiar from last year. Uh, the first one there is the uh, former Cumberland Farms at Two Sugarloaf Street, so right on the corner there. Um, uh, once again, James and Jason Heller, i.e. Stillwater Investments, are trying to get an underutilized properties grant to redevelop that uh, that site to serve as some kind of uh, restaurant slash um, Parklet. 
Um, you know, it would be wonderful to see it redeveloped. Obviously, it's a, it's a terrible eyesore now. Um, so the letter essentially just does the two things that you need to do. Um, says, hey, we're in support of this, and yes, this is definitely an underutilized property, uh, which it certainly is. So, um, so I've got that before you. Um, and uh, the other project is uh, up at the, the rail yard. Phil Nash has been trying to redevelop the green silos. Uh, next to the rail yard there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's, he's put out a few different ideas. The, this letter is, um, you know, in support of his project to create some kind of collaborative workspace up there. Um, yep. So again, he's also applying for an underutilized properties grant. Um, so it's unfortunate that they're competing against each other, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, both interesting projects and it would be great to see them come to fruition. Yeah, absolutely. I'd make a motion to support, um, to approve the letter of support for um, number two, Sugarloaf Street, South Deerfield, rehabilitation. As presented. As presented. And I'll second that for discussion. Um, so, go ahead. The, um, what is that, that, you're talking restaurants slash, I didn't hear what the other part of that was. Yeah, so I, I, what their application initially said was, uh, yeah, restaurant basically housed in that existing uh, gas station building, so they would rehabilitate that building. Uh, and then the kind of surrounding, you know, what was, used to be where the, the, the pumps and stuff were, that would become, I think they were looking at kind of um, maybe putting in some astroturf or something, string lights, just kind of sprucing it up and making it a space where people can hang out, benches, picnic tables, that kind of thing. Um, so not a full-fledged park, but as they say, parklet. So mm -hmm. that was their plan. I know others might be interested in it too, and they were looking at you know either commercial on the first floor, residential above, if they would take down the building and rebuild. So I'm not sure where they're at in that process either, but I'd like to see some, something happen right. soon. This has been going back and forth for a while, hasn't it? Ever since they moved. Yeah, once they got the gas tanks out of the ground and became yeah, a little much more, more viable. Uh, viable now. Um, so this, this letter of support doesn't talk about TIFFs, though, right? Correct. Because I think that's premature at this point uh, to talk about giving people tax breaks. Oh, so, yeah. Um, so, this just supports them yeah. hopefully getting a grant to move forward with something that we have to talk later. All right. So um, any other Thank you. Okay. All right. So, all those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Then I would make a, um, a motion to approve the letter of support for uh, six railroad yard road for um, Mr. Nash's project, as presented. And I'll second that. Discussion? Yeah. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a. It is a, um, a just kind of an empty. Let Chris. Oh, Christopher. sorry, go ahead. It's okay. I, uh, if you'd like, I can even pull up a, a picture really quick. But it's it basically there's some old grain silos up by the rail yard uh, and some large buildings associated with that. And Phil Nash, he's, he's had a few different ideas for, I, I believe he's owned the property for more than a decade at this point. Um, but um, he's had a couple different ideas for it. Um, if you can see here, uh, that's... This is some of the buildings he's looking at. Um, They're the, the giant silos. Um, so, you know, one idea had been basically to uh, convert it into some kind of uh, large workspace. Um, you know, he, his target audience, I believe, for that is people who need a lot of bandwidth. So, architects, uh, videographers, um, because he's got a fiber connection right there and he feels like there's an untapped niche in Western Mass where people need a really good internet connection and can do that kind of work. Um, so that's what he's, he's focused on with this grant application. Um, he's certainly got some other ideas uh, in the works as well that may come across our desks, but uh, that's the idea that's being supported at least for this grant application. So he'd be breaking this up and turning it into different workspaces mm -hmm. inside that, that building itself? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think he was, uh, he got this idea because for whatever reason, there's really good internet capability there mm -hmm. and uh, maybe related to the rail, railroad or something. So, uh, right, it has, a, it has a fiber optic connection right there, yep. Yep. 
So, any other discussion? Hearing none, um, all those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. All right, and that brings us to 7.30. Yay. And, uh, um, <laughs> Perfect time. That's it, right, Christopher? Yep, unless there's any other questions the board yeah. has, uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Appreciate you coming. Thanks, all. Thank you. Good evening. You too. All right. So next. Uh, welcome. We'll welcome yeah. again. Um, Allison Masley from Treehouse Brewing Company. And uh, yeah. oh, thank you for my introduction. Um, so I am here uh, to just sort of re open the discussion that we started last week um, for Blake's first week on uh, the Trios Half Marathon. So um, I just wanted to be able to address some of the concerns that had come out from last year's half marathon, let you know what Treehouse and DMSE are doing to improve upon those concerns and just the event in general. Um, I did have a PowerPoint slide deck, I think, do which we may be able to share or I Chris, can- Chris, do you yeah. have the ability to I, share? I'm, I'm happy to share it. Uh, Thanks, let me Chris. pull it up real quick. Thank you. Yep. Sure. Otherwise, we could all share oh. my paper. <laughs> all right, one of us can share it. And yeah, I just want to uh, talk about the event openly, candidly, let you guys ask questions, explain sure. as much as I can. Sounds good. All right, I'm getting it open right now. Sorry for the delay, folks. That's okay. Chris. Thank you, Chris. No problem. Sure. Treehouse Brewing Company Half Marathon um, that is set to be on September 15th. That is a Sunday. Um, it is about the same time as the event we had last year, which was Sunday, September 17th, 2023. Uh, so we tried to keep it in the same time frame, also keeping in mind different other events that happen, especially more prominently in Deerfield in the fall. Uh, you know, we, we've already spoken with the craft fair, make sure we're not stepping on those Great. that weekend spreading our police details too thin, yep. trying to keep in mind different college, you know, parents weekends and things like that. So we're, yeah. we're on the lookout for that, which is um, part of the reason why we wanted to get that announcement out there, right? So people yep. could start to plan to get out here because it is a particularly busy time. Great. Um, and we can go to the next slide. So um, the event course is going to be the same as last year with maybe a few modifications around the start line, but the general structure will be the same. It will be a, a circular loop within the town of Deerfield from Treehouse um, with a little bit of an out and back section on River Road and then ending at Treehouse. Um, again, the, the starting point along our property is to be determined based off of working through the that second egress with um, the police department. Right. But as a whole, the course is gonna stay the same. The water stations are going to stay the same, um, and we will work with the community to make sure that all of that is covered and um, communicated well. Um, and one of the ways that we hope to communicate better is by hiring um, a company to be a community liaison. And this person has worked with DMSE on several races and Ironmans um, in the past. And um, what she really brings to the table in this regard is that sort of um, personal touch, right? So she has the ability and the infrastructure and the experience to A, take a look at the people who would be impacted as a whole, and then make a comprehensive list of who is impacted, who needs to be notified, how they need to be notified. Um, and that would include mailers. Mm -hmm. We would open up an email address and phone number for people to call leading up to and on race day, but also just that personal touch. She will personally reach out, whether it's by phone, email, or in person to people along the route to kind of give them an opportunity to ask questions, but also to really give them 
as much information as we can that right. can't necessarily be construed in a, in a mailer. Right. That's great. Um, and I think we can move to the next slide. So again, just kind of touching upon that community involvement piece, which we yep. you know, really want to improve from last year. I think it's important to give the community something to want to be a part of, to mm -hmm. come. It gives them an opportunity to be part of an event, be at Treehouse for that event. Um, and also, you know, we, we do plan to donate to the Frontier Regional School for this event, and we actually um, had donations on the sign-up page, so we also were able to get volunteer voluntary donations through our race oh, registrations nice. that have already happened. So that was that was a really awesome thing to see. Just you know, sort of people automatically yeah. wanting to donate to that community they're coming to run into. That's great. Right. So I I think I heard something about this. So there's in addition to the minimum fifteen thousand donation. These voluntary donations are upwards of two thousand at this point. I think maybe even over at this point. Yeah, that's so awesome. that's, that's really good. Okay. Yeah. So we wanted to do anything we could to keep building that up, and yep. you know, um, obviously, then in working with different groups in the town to try to just sort of build that recognition that would help them get more donations in the future. Great. It's really great. And you're, you're, if I understand correctly, you you had some commentary last year that by starting earlier than you did last year, you might avoid some conflicts with churches and people going to houses yes. of worship. Yes, absolutely. So one of the, um, on, along the course, we do go right in the heart of downtown, right in front of a church. Um, and one of the things we learned last year, you know, we started at 8.30 last year to try to make sure that our runners, who are apparently very fast, a minute or an hour and eight minutes, I think was the, the winning time, something uh, along that. You know, we wanted to make sure that when they came back, they weren't waiting around for four hours to get a beer. Yep. Um, but <laughs> that being said, um, we have decided to move that race 30 minutes early because we do have coffee and seltzer. So, you yeah, know, they can right. come back, hang out, enjoy. So it'll be 8 a.m., which should help to alleviate a lot of that congestion and, and um, people trying to get out of the church just as the bulk of runners right. go by that area. That's good. Um, and then, you know, obviously... The more people in the region that are involved, the less people are trying to commute into the area, which helps solve some of the parking and traffic issues. Mm -hmm. So have you reached out or has there any been any discussion about reaching out to some of the organizations to help you with you know, parking and that sort of thing other than what you already have? I know we had a discussion about it last week or... Um, so parking lots? Yeah, and you know, um, people that can help with the the runners and the traffic and that sort of thing on the side roads and that sort of thing? It, uh, it has not started just yet. I'm, I'm open to getting it started, obviously, sooner rather than later. So if there's, if there's any contacts that, um, that you might know of um, that could be helpful there, that would be great. Um, otherwise, I, I do plan to sort of reach out to the different groups that we spoke with last year right. and then you know, kind of build from there. I was, I was thinking more of the community than the, the schools because I know the schools are going to participate anyways. I didn't know if, say, uh, and I don't know all of the, the groups that are out there now, but I know there's the Knights of Columbus and the Women's Club. Right, yes. That sort of thing. And those yep. are things we were, we were talking about, maybe getting them involved and them getting something out of it as well, of donation or for assisting and that sort of absolutely, thing. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> okay. Next and slide. Then, um, yeah, uh, I think we covered the parking stuff, so I yep. think that's good. Just uh, I threw the course map on there for you so you can kind of see the areas that are being impacted and the water stations just from a, a bird's eye view. Um, I can go into more depth on it if you, if you need. Um, but as a whole, the same areas that were sort of um, utilized last year will be utilized this year, but taking into account sort of some of the issues that we had last year with road closures and working mm -hmm. with DOT and, and police and public safety to make sure that those areas flow better this year and have better communication. And um, our yep. community liaison will be a big part of that as well. Yeah, they'll know, you know where you're setting up water stations, the residents know that's mm -hmm. happening, that kind of stuff, that's great. But the residents are now gonna be able to get out of their Homes yes. and be able to move because They'll have of the, the way the traffic to is set up. That. Yeah. Yep. 
obviously, you know, if they're okay hanging out at home, we want them to come and watch yeah. the race. But Cheer if, on, if they do need to leave, absolutely, yeah, they have that, that resource to be able to get in and out. Yep. Great. Um, next slide, please. And then, so just to, um, I gave you guys a nice lengthy document with, uh, you know, yes. a couple days ago and then a couple yep. amendments. I think it's like four sentences I added okay. uh, earlier with your new printout. But um, as a whole, I just wanted to give you also an update as to where we stand with our emergency action plan with the town, um, which is sort of that conditional um, piece of our 5,000 person occupancy, um, which we are making great progress towards. Uh, I saw the construction has started on the extra egress doors oh. at um, the building. So that is part of fire code and making sure we're able to comfortably fit 5,000 plus people inside should any sort of storm. you know, storm, tornado, what have yeah. you, event require everybody to come inside. We're also working on plans should everybody need to exit the building and, yep. and, and all of that along with the town. Um, That's great. And a lot of that is covered in that in that document you received. Um, and I apologize for the light read. Hopefully, you know you can do we'll it right before it. bed, and it'll we'll knock it. you right out. Yeah, exactly. Um, but some of the groups that we have met with for that are Deerfield Police, Fire, uh, South Deerfield Fire, excuse me, yep. um, South County EMS, the Board of Health, Building, um, Town Planner, and then in addition to those groups and getting their input, we also wanted to make sure we were coming to that group with a great, great starting point. So before those conversations even happened, we were meeting with um, different lo uh, local and you know, Massachusetts-based large-scale event venues to right. get a feel for what they do as best practices, as mm -hmm. well as um, we met with NEMA, um, the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, cybersecurity, to get yeah. a whole host of sort of input as to how we could improve all events. Great. Um, you know, in our 107,000 square foot building there. <laughs> small little thing. Just a little mm -hmm. small. Mm -hmm. Small thing. Good. Uh, one of the questions that's come up uh, that I've, even before I became a select, s select board member was the, the noise level of the concerts you've already had there. And there are people that are concerned about the noise level, especially in the center of town, and even as far away as a couple miles away because of the way that, you know, Sound it's flat and goes yeah. right through there. Is there anything in the plans or anything in the works to try to mediate that at all? Or what, what, do you, what are the thoughts on this? And I know we're getting a little bit off topic. No, but I absolutely. I'm, uh, have, it's part of the event plan anyway, so I'm happy to address it. Um, so last year when the um, stage we had was put in, based off of the leveling of the ground, the stage crew actually just put the stage where it would work for leveling, and that was not necessarily where the sound studies had best you know, worked for sound distribution. Obviously there's still gonna be sound carrying in mysterious ways, and you, know, you can hear the the train, no matter where you are, I feel like in Deerfield. So there's there's going to be a certain level of noise carrying, but we did level the playing field of where the stage needs to go. So we've we've built that infrastructure to restructure the stage, which I think goes in in a, a week or so. I think um, right after Memorial Day, um, the stage is going to be put in based off of that sound study that we had done and explored, so that we can best mitigate some of those noise concerns. And then obviously we will also continue to monitor the sound boards and sound at our property line and make adjustments as the concert season goes through. So you'll be monitoring the decibel levels and that exactly. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other, I know the other concern, and I, I touched upon this a little bit, um, on the last slide is just working with public safety and DOT to establish that comprehensive traffic management plan um, for roads, parking, and traffic during all events, not, not necessarily just the half marathon. Um, so for the half marathon, just to give you context, we did um, come up with a plan because our very fun narrow driveway does not necessarily allow for the best flow of shuttle buses. So for that half marathon, we will be applying for a permit from DOT to sort of establish a bus stop mm -hmm. um, south, uh, south, south of the um, 
driveway um, and that green space. So yeah. rather than have them come in, turn around and use up all that emergency space in yeah. the parking lot and you know congregation space, they'll just pull over along the side of Route 5 and then let you know the occupants of that shuttle off continue um, towards Greenfield and kind of do that as a nice big loop rather than um, pulling in and out of the driveway and blocking that for emergency vehicles. Um, and then we're also still continuing to work towards that secondary egress, um, but there are conservation concerns and then just, you know, apparently getting a survey and, um, you know, exploring the best egress point. Um, there are a couple of pre-approved curb cuts that we're working towards um, and just kind of figuring out which, which is the, the best choice. So the larger events, are they going to be similar to the way you're doing the marathon as far as parking goes? I mean, you're going to have off-site parking, or are you going to try to get 5,000 people to park on the property? Mm -hmm. No, 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 God, no. Um, so that should diffuse the traffic situation exactly, as well. Exactly, exactly. That's more for just the flow. Again, that, that one driveway we have mm -hmm. is so narrow, so just trying to build a better right. um, flow of the shuttles and people um, in and out. Um, and then for I like the idea of you doing this for special handicapped people, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and then everybody else getting shuttled in. I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, so for the other, like the concerts and, and such, right now, um, the, con the concerts, all the um, contracts that we have out there are for 1,500 attendees. So yeah. we're, we're going with, you know, the solutions that we were able to get to last year. Uh, we will be parking at Yankee Candle um, and shuttling in people. Some people will be parking on site for those just because it is a smaller event. We don't yep. need the right. parking lot. Apparently runners do not necessarily want to be hanging out in wet grass and I don't blame them for right. that. So we learned last year that parking on site meant there was nowhere for runners to stand that was dry and that's why we are uh, just making it a no park zone. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. That's good. And the, the, the current EAP plan that you're working on is is really still with the 1500 but it, it's looking forward to when you are able next year to go to a larger assuming that everything is that the uh, the people who are responsible for signing off on this do which is not the select board it's right, our emergency right. management teams yeah and i mean i think what what part of my goal in creating the document that is before you guys is to create a scale upable mm -hmm process right so it's it's you know at a bare minimum we need this if we were at a 2,000 person event we would need this if we were yeah. at a 3,000 4,000 etc yeah. so we have that infrastructure in place to kind of to wiggle yeah. um, and obviously you know the the construction brings us to meeting the needs from the fire department standpoint for that 5,000 um, but right now the same rules apply for a smaller event right mm -hmm. good and one thing that uh, people should be aware of and hopefully feel reassured about is that this is a document that has to be updated every year. Thank you for bringing and that up, yeah. So as situations arise and as we learn, um, we can adjust the document every year to better serve the residents. Better serve the residents, better serve Treehouse, and yeah, make sure we, exactly. you know, we're, we're following the best practices and, right. you know. You'll learn after every, exactly. every one, so. Yeah. Good. Public safety as well, you know. For sure, they'll they'll learn as well. Yeah. So, um, anything else you wanted to share with us, Allison? I'm trying to think. I think that's um, that's probably it for my slide. I think I have a picture yep. for you though, if you want to click ahead. <laughs> oh, we're good. Ah, There's a picture. Just you know, Fun little feel good picture feel for good. you guys at the end there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, but this is, you know, just a few pictures from the half marathon event last year. Um, the, you know, the beginning start. Um, we had some photo opportunities inside. Different, um, you know, different groups of people hanging out on the Adirondack chairs. As a whole, it almost never felt that crowded, except I think if you were in the running queue, that was probably the only time you really felt it. Yeah. Um, but that event was 3,000 last year with 2,100 runners. This year, we're looking at a 5,000 total event, yeah. but with 2,500 runners, yeah. and the 5,000 really is to help sort of mitigate the issues we had last year with spectator tickets. So last year, 
you know, it was like 2,100 runners, 600 spectator tickets because we still needed staff and volunteers. Right. This year, we wanted to have a more one-to-one ratio. And then it's, it, you know, as runners started to sign up, we noticed that not everybody needed a spectator. So that right. was helpful. So we have some wiggle room to maybe allow other people to bring two or three right. or what have you. And we'll, we'll work on that system as yeah. we, you know. And without the parking, that'll make a difference too. Exactly. Yeah, yeah apparently it'll feel too. bigger. Exactly. Yeah. It's good. Good. You good? I'm good, Trevor. Okay. Well, thank you, Allison. So, thank um, you. since we don't have anything to do with the plan, um, I will. Yep. Yep. That make, was for your reading pleasure. Yep. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Um, we really don't do that during the meetings, but um, it has to do with this. That's that's. If you want public, um, I'll allow it this time. Yeah. So go ahead, come up and identify yourself. And Bert Zadowski, uh, River Road, South Deerfield. Uh, I have a concern. In fact, I addressed the board on this. I never got an answer about uh, some of us are cut off completely. We cannot get out of our houses. We can't uh, get off the road and get access. So what happens in an emergency? That's all changed, Bernie. That's all okay. changed, Bernie. Because we should have been notified, and I was upset about that. We've heard that. We learned from that. That's all changed. Okay. You'll have access. You'll have somebody will be in contact with you. So if you need to get out, there'll be a number you can call, whatever. There'll be people around you. Learned a lot from last time. That was a big concern last time. Not enough community relations uh, ahead of time, so they've hired a firm to be able to do that. So you'll be able to you'll be able to move. So when they have this meeting, that's the time to come and address this. Not here. Is that uh, what you're telling me? Address which this issues. I, I don't want, I don't know what the plan looks like. So uh, to me, this will, this will be a public doc. This e this, this emergency, large-scale emergency okay. plan will be a public document you can, you can look at and, and read. Um, this will address larger events, but will also address this, this half marathon, too. And if you have anything, just reach out to us. If you, and there'll, there'll be a liaison that you, with a phone number you can call and say, I have an issue with this. I okay. want to talk to this person. I need to be able to get out at this time. Or we'll make, we'll make sure it happens. OK, so this is going to be taken care of. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, yeah, for sure. in fact, we we discussed this last week, and the, the the route hasn't changed, but the way they do the route has changed, yes. so that everybody can get out. I don't know if you heard me when I talked about it when I asked her. I says, so this means everybody will be able to get out of their drivers and go wherever they need to go, and she said yes. Yeah. So that was tonight. We we actually had clarified that to okay. make sure that that was taken care of. Yeah, that's a concern I had is that we couldn't right. we, in an emergency we, and we we didn't yeah. know. No one told us. No one knew. Yeah, how did I tell you so? Last time. Mm -hmm. yep. So yeah. yeah. Okay. And the, they will also be starting a half hour earlier, so they'll be by that church because everybody was coming out of church just as the runners were coming through. So they'll be long gone by there. By well, most. We so hope. there'll be some there'll stragglers be people, for yeah. sure, but but it won't be the mass coming by right at, right at the time where everybody's coming out of the church. So okay. Thank trying you. To, trying to learn. Thank you for your comment. It's great. All right, Charlene. Yes, if you want to come up. Now, You've got to come, come to the mic. <laughs> Please identify yourself. Just so people on, online can hear you. Yep. Take your time. Sherilyn oh. Galinsky, 342 River Road. Um, will the potholes be filled on that road be, for the safety of the runners? Because I go on that road a lot, and around those S curves where there aren't any houses, there are some pretty good sized holes. So. Unless those are filled in, it's going to be quite dangerous for the runners. Great, great time. So, I know that we've been so, working on that. Yeah, um, yep. what I've been told from Kevin Scarborough at the DPW is that he was working on um, filling potholes from Pine Nook to Old Pine Nook to the, the cemetery. Are those the ones you're speaking about, or are you well, speaking about? Well, there's that, that section more? after you get off a hillside, you take a left, yeah. right. um, and you go toward. Greenfield, like, yeah, right, and there's that turns. section of houses. Um, I mean, there's that section of 
no houses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We call them the S-curves. Yeah. Yeah. And They're there are nice. three or four. I have to negotiate my car. Mm -hmm. right. And I, and I now narrow. know how to do it after I hit it the first time. But A resident um, brought that up, and Tim, Tim got on that. They're, yeah, it's they're just too, it'll that. be too dangerous. for yeah. If you're going to have people going up and coming back, there's not going to be much room to, right. to negotiate. Okay. That was just my concern. Yeah, right. no, thank, thank you, you for bringing thank it to their comment. attention. Yep. Thank you. I got a feel on my street too that need to be done. <laughs> They're You're everywhere. On the route, right. Trevor, come on. They're <laughs> everywhere right now. <laughs> so, um, all, right, all right. So, if there's nothing else, then um, I would like to make a motion to approve the half marathon plans as presented by Treehouse Brewing Company for the half marathon event on September 15, 2024, with the coordination from the town's public safety departments. I'll second the motion. Any discussion? All those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Thank, Thank you, Allison. You. Thank you. I appreciate nice to see you your... Yeah, good to see you, Thanks, too. Thanks, we'll Keep in touch and let us know on this. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Keep your eyes catching if you mind couldn't. Please let me know. I will try. I'll try to keep moving. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great night. Yep. Nice to meet you. All right. So in the interest of time, time it's um, close closing in on eight o'clock. So um, does anyone have any select board announcements that they feel compelled to bring forward? Still working, uh, just real quickly, just still still working on a plan moving forward for the um, effluent pipe from the plant that washed out from the river. So we're working with um, DPC and engineering to kind of figure out where that, uh, what needs to get done. We put some cameras in. We're also looking, reaching out to other entities for funding. Um, I gave them a copy of what oh, you sent to yeah, me. Yeah, there was a, a letter from SRF, which is the State Revolving Fund. That's generally the, the entity that funds um, wastewater and water infrastructure projects with the state. There are two 20-year note at 2%, which is about the cheapest you can find for financing. Not sure if that's uh, our only avenue. We're, we're reaching out for help other places. We're going to talk with the Army Corps of Engineers. We did talk with NRC H, NRC something. NRCS. NRCS. Yeah. Um, th this project is too big for them. They usually do smaller streams next to a road kind of embankment. Um, th th and it's on the Connecticut, which is something that's over, over and above them. So it's really going to be Army Corps of Engineers that's need to have to address it. So we're moving forward that process. We've notified DEP and just trying to get, get our ducks in a row and see what it will cost. Um, but survey is going out now to get that surveyed. So that's all I have on that. Yeah, and just a couple of additional points on that. We we did declare an emergency and we're gonna sign the emergency declaration tonight um, related to the heavy rains that we had in um, April, about a month ago. Mm -hmm. And um, the SRF funding it, there are some grant opportunities, but it's obviously that would be the first course of action is to look for Money. actual grants that we don't have to pay back. Yeah. Um, and to that end, I pass that along to Chris Nolan and, and in addition to Casey, Chris Nolan and Christopher Dunn to see Any what if, what what they can do to, to try and help us explore what grant opportunities might exist. Yep. So, okay. And um, I don't have any Board of Health or no nope. announcements. Take, I'll take over Carolyn's spot. The ticks are out. Yeah. The, the mosquitoes, mosquitoes are coming out as well. The mosquitoes, we had, BTI treatments have been done in the yep. heavy water over near Eastern Ave and Graves. And, um, but there were, they came out early this year, I, yep. I have to say. And with all the water. Um, yep. So, um, and we don't have any minutes tonight, right? No. Yep. Thankfully. Um, and so um, now we're into discussion and decision items and the the first thing, ARPA funds is going to be put on hold. Um, I want to meet with Brenda uh, when she gets back from vacation with Casey and Brenda to, to us, just to see where we stand on that. Okay. Um, the next thing is the South County Senior Center Board of Oversight recommendations. Yeah. And uh, do you have anything on that, Casey, uh, that you want to give an overview, or do you, do you want Trevor to do it? So we received you'll find in your packet we received a letter from the south county senior center board of oversight um with a, with a recommendation on the holy family lease we also have and this is something that i think if you have questions about the lease language itself um for the delta sand and gravel lease which is the administrative space in sunderland chris nolan can probably answer most of those questions he handled that meeting 
Um, essentially, the lease for Delta Sand and Gravel is ready to go. Yep. Um, and generally, the town administrator signs those leases. Um, the recommendation from the Board of Oversight is not to proceed with a lease for the Holy Family Catholic <coughs> space. And there's a letter there in reference to that. So, and was that on part on the advice of council? Um, or it was a conversation or? that happened. I think Trevor can sort of yeah the, talk um, to that. So why don't we handle me. the Delta Sand and Gravel yeah. since we can handle that first, so right? I would so you want to make a motion? Sure, I make a motion to um, to approve the, and authorize the town administrator to sign the lease as presented with Delta Sand and Gravel Inc. for real property located at 22 Amherst Road, Sunderland, Massachusetts, in the yearly amount of twenty-two thousand six. $180 paid monthly in the amount of uh, $1,890 for a one year term effective June 1st, 2024 through May 31st, 2025. I'll second that for discussion. Uh, so this is, this is um, the, the administrative building that we're in right now. Uh, we went out for an RF, RF, RFP. RFP, thank you. P's and Q's mixed I up. know. <laughs> Too many um, So, So they, uh, they came back with a favorable lease and would like to continue using the space um, for, for that area. So that's that. For at least for the lease of the year. And I think we can extend it. We um, can extend it, each, yes. Each year. As and I have to say, Jennifer and uh, Chris did a very good job discussing that and handling. Yep. Chris did the procurement, and then they sat down with... Uh, representatives from Delta Sand and Gravel, yep. um, TJ O'Connor, and went through the lease language. Yeah. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. and um, you know, uh, as the uh, the temporary library space has is, is been renovated and Looks amazing. Should, should open up just about the time when these leases are um, open up for the seniors, you know, the, just about the time when these leases are up for reconsideration. So, um, that will relieve this problem um, and going forward. You've been working hard with well, you know, I've and, done, yeah, uh, we've done your... some, we've done some things. I mean, yep. the kitchen is coming together and it should is. be completed. Thanks to Senator Comerford getting us a hundred thousand dollar grant to yep. to work on that space for senior services in the future. Well, I just want to thank you for your your time volunteering as well uh, by putting cabinets together, put the flooring down. I mean, it's that kind of stuff that really makes a difference and, and makes a project, uh, you know, affordable. Um, I didn't do it for recognition. I, I, just, I, I know, did it because that's I, why, that's why I'm recognizing you. you so know, I really, I, no, I do appreciate it. It's, so, uh, it's, it's great. Anyways, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Delta, any, any comments on this one? No. Okay. You wait um, a second. Yeah, okay. yeah. uh, so all those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. The BOO had um, had some discussions trying to enter into, um, you know, a lease to continue on at the Holy Family. Um, there were some um, requests made um, of uh, the governmental agencies to continue um, uh, working there or using the space on the limited time that we could. Um, we're very grateful for the time that we had there. Um, the require the requests weren't something that we could we could um, continue with based on the grants that we get from the state and um, it would put our grant money in jeopardy to to do that because we have to be inclusive but we respect the you know the wishes of the church and understand where they were coming from and we just um, so we really grateful for the time we spent there we're working on other spaces there is some space in um, at the old the old town hall in Waitley that they'll do some of the larger things and as you said fairly soon we hope uh, keep continue working <coughs> on the the church here we'll be able to um, to use the 1821 space so. so that's it so that was the recommendation from the um, the board that we would just wouldn't enter into that at this time mm -hmm. so they're they're on going search for is is there still any negotiation, or is it just dead uh, on the wall? It, it is dead at the moment, uh, unless unless the entities wanted to bring us something that we you know that we could agree to. Right. It was just a matter of legal. We couldn't we couldn't uh, do what they wanted, no, I and, and I totally that respect part of their their wants too. I mean, right. they have they have it's a private entity. They have their their wishes, and and we totally respect that. They've no, been so good to us for the last right. you know, two years. 
But I do know that they have allowed it in the past and haven't had any issues with other locations as yeah. well. Yeah, and so I, that's I why I just think it, it kind of came out of nowhere during the during the um, discussion. Right. So we just we just we respectfully just couldn't move forward. But right. we're very grateful for their time. They were wonderful to us. Uh, still are wonderful to us. Right. We just couldn't um, based on the grants that we get legally. Right. We couldn't continue from there. Yep. So, um, all right, so now the next order of business is, um, should be fairly quick. Um, the South County EMS uncollectible funds request for a write-off. And um, oh, so. Yep. You received a letter from um, yep. Chief Sparks. Yeah, yes. we have this letter from May 10th. Uh, Deerfield Select Board member South County EMS currently has uncollected debt due to unpaid ambulance bills for calls beginning January of 2023. Several of these bills should remain in active status with our billing agency, Comstar Ambulance Billing, FFR, and it's our intention to pursue collection for services rendered. $251,673.46 of this debt is considered uncollectible due to the patient being deceased, mm -hmm. having filed for bankruptcy, living in a state where Comstar is not legally authorized to collect debt, or has passed beyond the statute of limitations. Um, this amount will not be collected, however, it remains in active status. I request that the select board vote to write off the amount of 251,000, this is a typo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yep, $251,673.46 as it cannot be collected and our billing agency has canceled the debt. Uh, respectfully, Joshua Sparks, Chief of Department, and a lot of this, um, a lot of this debt is actually probably from as much as five years ago, yeah. mm -hmm. um, because there was a period of time when we didn't send uncollected debt to the collection agency for for want of just checking a box that says, if you don't collect within a certain period of time, send it to the secondary collection agency. Um, and this is a normal process for South County. Um, sometimes it's a Medicare recipient and they only get a fixed amount from Medicare and the rest of the billing can't be collected um, and or, um, yeah, they just, exactly. So um, going forward, since we've now uh, checked off this box, all, all delinquent debt will go through a, a, a prompt and timely process where it passes from uh, the three-month period, goes to a secondary collection agency, a determination is made, and then the chief will make a recommendation um, to write off the debt if, if that's necessary or to uh, basically our, our auditor has had to look at this sitting on our books for a long time. And is, mm -hmm. it's one of those things that with long-term uncollected debt becomes uh, a weight on your credit rating and so yeah. this is a good good opportunity to take this debt that we're never going to collect off the books yeah do you I, no i just uh just to comment on that i know that you said that they're uh he's going to be working on other ways other avenues to be collecting as well as mm -hmm. checking the box yeah but it, and uh there are other avenues you can take with it as well so i definitely want to sit down and talk to him, be that yep. I've had a history with that, so. Yeah, and in, interestingly, it's um, different, different healthcare providers um, pay at different rates, and some of them try to pay the little, the least amount they can to begin with until you force you to write letter, collection letters saying, look, you know, we have a 96% per percent collection rate with this other insurance company. Why are you only paying 80%? And so you know, it's an active process, but yeah, you, we can learn from you, Blake. Uh, yeah. You know, so by all means, we should set up a time for you and Joshua to talk about this. So, make, so I'll make a, uh, I'll make a motion to um, uh, take um, Chief Sparks' recommendation to write off the debt of uh, two hundred fifty-one thousand six hundred seventy-three dollars and forty-six cents. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. All right. Um, next up is 
one part of uh, the Jewett Avenue, Avenue property disposition process that we're yep. going through. So yep. can you talk to that, Casey? I briefly? can. So town meeting, very quickly, town meeting approved disposition of the property. And so there's a process for that, a procurement process. And part of that, is, the first part, is requesting that the select board declare the property surplus for disposition. So I wrote you a quick email included, and thanks to Chris, it's much easier to read, included a, uh, propo a suggested motion um, that essentially says, yes, Casey, we've declared it surplus property. That will allow me to formally pull together the uh, request for proposal document. So I'll make a motion to declare the property on Jewett Ave identified in the Deerfield Assessor's records as map 169, lot 186, surplus property for purposes of disposition as approved by annual town meeting on April 29, 2024. I second it. Thank you. Okay, motion is made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Um, you need no, I think that this is this is j before we go into negotiations of right. what they're going to end up right. getting, purchasing yeah, it for. Just yeah, just putting it up. For, right. So yeah. essentially this is the, you're saying it's surplus to be disposed of. I will develop an RFP document with timelines and included in that is a draft contract that we would use once we got to a certain part of that procurement process. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to you with more information. Yep. Yep. So the first first step's taken care of if we approve this? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> I have an appraisal. I have a survey. All of these things have to be identified. And so the next thing I will probably ask you is to think about the property value, but mm -hmm. I'm not quite there yet. I have a couple conversations I need yep. to have with council. Okay. Because how we craft the RFP is going to be... Um, helpful to how we dispose of the property. Yep. Yep. Okay. So if there's no further discussion, all those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Great. All right. Um, and the next thing, um, I, is Kevin here? We normally He's not. Get yeah. a recommendation from yeah. Kevin. Do you have uh, a recommendation? Okay, go ahead. I do, I do and I don't. And yeah. thanks to Christopher, he wrote it up. Um, so I did have a conversation with Kevin. And Christopher, in the suggested motions that he gave you, identifies the FY24 pricing for both right. transfer station stickers and bags. In my conversation with Kevin, he indicated to me that he would prefer that we keep those the same. Okay. And he, I suggested that maybe we discuss the other costs, like the bulky item costs. He said, he asked me if the board would add that as an agenda item for the 29th and he would come back with okay. some more information. So if you are so inclined to vote the transfer station sticker fees and the bag fees, and I read through the votes and um, those are what Chris has drafted up for you or the yeah. information that was basically approved last year, that would al at least allow everybody to start sell selling stickers yeah. okay. and bags. So I'll make a motion uh, to set the FY25 station uh, transfer station sticker fee at $70 for the first sticker. Um, and then I'll go on to do that. We'll vote this one first. All right. Um, I'll second that for discussion. The second price is $10. Yeah. Yes, I'm I, sorry. Yes. I'm, yeah, I'm I didn't sorry. have that in the notes, but yeah. It, so the yeah. first, the first one is seventy, and if you have a second vehicle in your family and you want to use it, it's only a ten dollar for that second. Thank sticker. you. Sorry. Okay. So, so um, motion made and seconded. Any discussion? All right. Um, all those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. And then I will make a second motion uh, to set the pricing for the town trash bags at seventeen dollars for a ten pack of small bags and $28 for a 10-pack of large bags. Um, that's the current price of this, this past year. Um, and then in, in the motion, just I would also, uh, to continue the senior discount for a free roll of small bags or an equ equivalent credit, $17, off the cost of the large bags with the purchase of a first sticker uh, for residents age 65 and older. Second. Great. So this is the same price that was this year right. and it just continues yeah. the same price? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, any further discussion? 
Nope. All those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim and Hilchey, aye. And then on the 29th, we'll talk about bulky items. I did talk with Jim up there uh, on the weekend, and he had requested, and I related to Kevin already, but it, you know, it was on the weekend. So if you see him again, we wanted to um, update the signs since we got the new shed. We don't have the signs that have the price for the bulky items. Um, you know, like uh, mattress is this much, or you know, this much for lumber, that kind of thing. When you're throwing it away, um, so we just wanted to have that sign. I asked if if Janamine had any grant money or something, or if there was any money for signage. We also, I think, the only sign talking about recyclables, what goes in and what doesn't go in, is in Spanish. So I think the other one blew away. So um, we just wanted to get some updated signs for the transfer station to clean up the space. Um, okay. So, and he, he was aware, but I know <coughs> I, I sent it on a Saturday and okay. I don't expect him to remember. So I'll see if I can, um, I'll remember something. He may have already though. jumped on it, but I just wanted he to He might that. have. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So the only question I have is that on the, the bulky items like mattresses and stuff like that. Yep. We have people that are coming in from other towns that are paying to get rid of it. Is that, that is part of the. The setup up there? Yes, yeah. For for mattresses, we're part of the you know Franklin Solid Waste, and there's only so many places where you can. And they have a, a specific um, roll-off trailer right. there that you can pay it in. So they pay a certain amount. We store it in there. Really, just for just for mattresses. I don't think they can get anything else there. Yeah, it was just people that were had mattresses. Yeah, they were, yep, if they were okay. from other areas. Like I don't know if Conway has a, a no, thing, so they, they come were, to us. Somebody from Conway was yeah, there. So they I'm come to us to, to to store it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think Janamine got this got this whatever look. Yeah, roll off thing. roll off thing yep. that uh, with the understanding that it would be a regional per you know. Yep. Asset and that works out well. Um, yeah. Side topic, we should, you know, again, these topics we want to talk to Kevin about before he goes. There was a plan to re-engineer the traffic flow. Um, might have been before your time, Tim, even, um, of the transfer station. I don't know where he's at on that, if he still has that. And the plan was to kind of change the way it flowed. He may have just settled on leaving it the way it is now, but we were changing some stuff. Um, but we should, we should just kind of firm that up before he mm -hmm. leaves. And, he also had mentioned just to bring everybody up to speed at one time that there was um you know we take a lot of brush there uh every weekend and and then they load up in the loader dump in the dump truck and bring it down back well down back is getting really full so at some point we might need to invest in a chipper something i mean we have a chipper but we may need a second hand something or other to just try to make some more room because it seems to be getting i remember a couple of years ago we mentioned it and each Sunday I see it fill up, or every Saturday it fills up. So mm -hmm. just are two they, cents on that. Are they composting back there? Or is we, it? No, not back there. We do have compost there. You can bring yeah. compost, yeah, and then uh, it goes to one of the local businesses. Because even though the brush is going there, there's a lot of grass and other things going in there. And that might be part of how you, you chip those, chip that up fine and put it in with the... Yeah, it it might be yeah we need to, to look at that. Explore yeah, right. composting for sure. Tree tree uh, branches and all yeah. that stuff. Either that, or we could start selling mulch. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Sorry, so that. yeah, I'll go that. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is um, I'll let Casey talk about our insurance. Um, yep. So very briefly, we received the Maya Insurance Program participation notifications, and. Chris did a great job of doing all of our renewal information. This is the last piece. Mm -hmm. um, generally, I do this on a regular basis, but with new leadership, I wasn't sure how I should handle it, so I put it on the agenda. Essentially, I need the board to approve our renewals for property liability, workers' comp, and injured on duty, yep. as well as um, recommend that we sort of continue with Maya. I think Maya is our best choice, and I've had this conversation with Brenda before. Um, the benefits to the town are huge. We've got opportunities to lower costs through credits, unique yep. training, and availability for grants. So this is something that you don't find in your general insurance marketplace. Right. Um, but it's, it's the last piece of that is, do, does the select board want the town administrator to continue to manage the insurance program? I think it is an operational responsibility, but again, because we're sort of in transition, I wanted to bring it to the board for consideration. My two cents is yes, I, I'm very pleased with Maya. We do get a lot of credits. They try to help us 
many, many ways. So I'd make the motion and would discuss it. So uh, I make a motion to accept and, and to authorize town administrator to sign the proposal for the Massachusetts Interlocal Insurance Association, MAYA, dated April 29th, 2024, for continued participation in the Maya Property Liability Workers' Compensation and Injured on Duty programs for fiscal year 2025. Second. So yeah, and I just wanna emphasize that Brenda Hill, the accountant, um, is recommending this as our best financial yeah. option. Yeah, mm -hmm. the two of us do. For sure. And again, there's, uh, is, there's nothing out there that's got this kind of coverage that we would be getting through them. You'd have to be doing different insurance agencies mm -hmm. to cover everything, Right. I'm assuming. We would, if we were gonna change, we would have to go out to bid. Um, there are very few insurance groups that participate in the municipal market. It's somewhat mm -hmm. unique. Yeah. Um, one of the things that Maya does do is they provide not just access to reasonably cost insurance, but they also provide access for training mm -hmm. and for information sessions that you wouldn't normally get in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I noticed, especially coming from a community that used Maya for a much longer term mm -hmm. when I worked there than Deerfield had. And when we go to uh, Boston each year, the comp um, Maya is a big partner of the conference, but M M MMA. M MMA puts it on. Um, but they run programs, you know, trainings there that each one of us go to and we make sure we scan in because we get credits back and it reduces our costs. So we make sure to max all those classes out every time we go. And then they'll offer other trainings and service stuff, you know, OSHA stuff, all, all kinds of different trainings to the town if we need. So they're a good entity for sure. Expensive as all insurance is. Insurance went up significantly this year. Yep. Across the board. Which was in the in the warrant in the yep. budget we passed this year. Yeah, that that was reflected in the in the budget at our annual town meeting. So anything else? Like, no, I got one more. All right. Um, yeah. So um, motions were made and seconded. All those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Then I make a motion to accept and authorize the town administrator to sign the proposal for the Massachusetts Interlocal Insurance Agency Maya, dated May 3rd, 2024, for continued participation in the Maya Unemployment Services Program. This is our, our uninsurance. Second. Uh, unemployment insurance. So you want to. Just briefly tell us this, about this case. So here. this is actually a free service that Maya started giving us a year ago. And we used to pay about fourteen to sixteen hundred dollars a year. Essentially they monitor our unemployment claims and help us um, maintain as low a cost response as as we can. Um, and it's something that they onboarded as a trial the first year. So it's turned out to be it's the same company we were paying for before, but the benefit, this is one of the reasons that Maya can really be a useful benefit, is we were having to pay for this before. We pay a smaller fee now, but it's less than we were paying when we were paying for it independently. Um, and they coordinate very closely with the treasure collector and the assistant treasure collector to help us monitor whatever our requirements under unemployment are. Any, any comments? Any, no? Nope. All right. Uh, no further discussion. Uh, all those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Excellent. Um, so this one, hopefully, will be... Um, Trevor, you've been handling the, uh, the warrants and the bills and payable and payroll um, authorization. Are you... I'm happy to continue doing that. Love to do that. But I, I'm also open. I was going to, you know, sit yeah. with Blake, too, yeah, when I do them exactly. with you guys and just kind of talk about what I do so you're up on it. Because generally, we, we vote one person a year, but we also vote uh, that anybody can sign. Any one member can sign. That way, if I'm out of town or Tim's out of town, you can sign. And and even if you know I sign, doesn't mean that you can't come and sign too and right. go and go over everything. But um, when do you normally do this? Uh, so I usually time? yeah every every other Wednesday I get a message from um, from the uh, treasurer just saying that or, or Brenda or somebody will mention that hey the warrant's ready it's on the desk or they'll bring it over and leave it on our desk and then I'll come in that day or that night and, and I go through every single bill 
that's in there. Um, I don't go through all the bills, but all the bills are in there. And then on the top are your um, payroll and your um, all the bills. So then if there's anything that looks out of the ordinary, I'll dig through the pile and look at it. If I have any questions before, I can go to Brenda and ask her, hey, what was this? Or I'll call Kevin and say, did we already do this? Or is this something that you needed? Or is this, you know, I don't want to second guess somebody, but our job is to second guess them. So, so I, I'll look over every bill that we sign and then I'll sign off the warrant and I turn it into uh, the treasurer. And then, then the next day they'll pay the bills. Okay. So do that He's every, the third every layer weeks. of second guessing. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, everybody else second guesses before me. But, <laughs> okay. but it's always yeah. good to have somebody else after me too. So yeah. I always love to have you do it. And, you know, I sat in with Trevor when I first came on to see how the process went and um, you know he does this with his Pella professional <laughs> stuff so he's <laughs> adept at it um, but by all means def definitely sit down with him and go through it I definitely want to learn yeah, it it's, it's good <laughs> to learn, sure. for sure yep. learn the process mm -hmm. yep. for sure. so the next item here is actually basically done it was we had authorized Casey to oh. you know negotiate and sign <laughs> this contract and Great. the only thing that was an issue and she's resolved it since is is the term of uh, the length of term of when the work was going to be done so yep um i think that's that's what i was waiting anything. to yeah. yep. i just wanted to make sure that because yep. i tim reminded me i went oh i thought that but i wasn't positive so yep. so, so i should have um, that done soon yeah um and then so now i'm just going to let you sort of take over the placeholders, which ones apply and which ones which don't. Which ones don't? Okay. So, Chris, what do you have on the Leary lot? Uh, before we get into that, before I forget to remind anybody, um, for placeholders, permits for review and approval, uh, this one didn't make it onto the agenda proper, um, but because there's a placeholder there, I'm hoping it can still be addressed tonight. It's in your folder. There's a one day liquor license application oh. from Yankee Candle Village. Oh, sure. yeah, it is in there. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Yeah. All right, so you want to read it? Sure. You didn't type it in right, please. So uh, I'll make a motion to approve the Yankee Candle Village one day liquor license for, um, for a Pride Day event at Yankee Candle Village on June 1st from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. for beer and wine from uh, Powder Hollow in the courtyard. That's it. Second. I think everything's good. The so for discussion, are always yeah. here. Yeah. Yep. All set. Everything in order, Casey? Everything does. in order? Okay. Yep. So, so this is a, uh, they've had these events before. Oh, yes. Yes. It's yes. just a normal thing. Yeah, yeah. every when time, it, yeah, a lot of entities in town might have like, um, Deerfield Academy might do something or Yankee Candle. They just have a one-day event. They, yeah. they apply, we ask them to apply several weeks in advance. Right. They do, and then we're right. Right, and they have we to provide give them a range. insurance, but uh, yeah. This one is the this serving alcohol outside the uh, the the actual right um, space space that they do normally. So do it's outside. They, yeah. Do they have a they have an a area? Already. Yeah, but do they, they have, have their own licensed they, space? And so, so the only the way the for them to do a right. special event so is to be outside. Can't go walk in right. exactly. The no, no, they got to stay there. Okay. Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, motion's been made and seconded. Is any further discussion? All those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Great. So we got to sign that. All right. Um, continue there, Chris. Chris. Sure. Um, so I will start on the Leary lot. Um, that's the, the first section of my assistant town administrator report for this week for you all. Um, yep. Yes. We are making very good headway on that. So the civil and site work for the construction of the lot is currently up to bid. Uh, it was advertised and made available to bidders starting Wednesday, May 8th. Uh, we just had a mandatory site visit for interested bidders yesterday morning at 10 a.m. and we had seven come out, which is which is pretty good. Um, we had 26 plan holders initially and, and seven from that is, is a sizable chunk. So we'll have seven people qualified um, which which should give us a decent amount of competition and that can hopefully keep our prices competitive um, A little bit of a timeline that I included for you all May 8th we have the invitation for bids um, The design documents finalized and the legal advertisement that's done uh, Just yesterday on the 14th. We had the site visit in person uh, 
Coming up on May 23rd, we have a 2 p.m. deadline to receive the sealed bids, and that is also when the bid opening will take place. Uh, May 24th, we, I, I am hoping if the process goes smoothly, we will have a clear lowest eligible and responsible bidder who we can send a notice of award to. Uh, right before I take off for the week on my honeymoon for May 28th through May 31st. Um, I'll come back, we'll do contract negotiations with the awarded vendor. Um, I intend to have a civil and site work contract ready to bring to the select board for a vote by the June 12th meeting. Uh, Mid-June, we'll see contractor mobilization from the awarded vendor, uh, which would allow work to begin as early as late June, early July. Uh, that is slated for fall 2024 completion, so that is a pretty rapid pace, but we're we're doing everything in our power to make sure that remains possible. Uh, and the installation of the level two EV chargers would happen in the fall. Uh, winter to early spring is going to be the completion of those final punch list items on the contract. Some of the plantings are gonna be waiting until that time just because the weather will be more conducive at that point than in the late fall into early winter. Um, However, the level three chargers, uh, there is a pretty significant lead time on getting those because they're such a relatively new technology. Um, that's likely going to be into the winter or early spring of 2025 as well. Um, so our CFI grant agreement is still waiting final review by the Federal Highway Administration. We have a meeting with them on Monday to go over what else we could possibly do to uh, make sure that we're, we're on top of this. We have submitted everything that's been asked of us, but we want to make sure that we're not uh, falling behind other awardees since we have a shovel-ready project at this point. Uh, we're remaining insistent on having this in place within the next month, at the very latest, so that it's completely executed before we award a contract for civil and site work. Um, a separate procurement is taking place for the state contract VEH-102 for the purchase of the EV charging equipment itself. Uh, we're ordering two level two and two level three chargers for the Leary lot, all of which will need to be compliant with the Department of Energy's National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure or NEVI program. Uh, and they're also going to be compliant with the Buy America requirements of all of the programs under the bipartisan infrastructure law, including the CFI grant. Uh, level two chargers are expected to arrive by fall if ordered this month. Like I said a minute ago, level three chargers do have a longer lead time, so it's likely we won't see those until the spring if they're ordered within the next month, which is our plan. Um, however, all infrastructure that they rely on will be included. In fact, a lot of that is already installed. Universal Electric has been doing great work the past couple of weeks, and I, I think they've actually completely wrapped that up. So the, the conduits in the ground, the transformer has been ordered, and we're essentially going to be ready to just pop those chargers right on when they come in. Right. Um, so that's going to be a pretty straightforward process, and I will keep you all fully updated as we move through these various steps. Does anybody have any Leary Lot specific questions? Nope. Thank you. Great work. Thank you. Lots of good work. Yep. All right. Um, so in this placeholder, um, we've already dealt with. Yeah, you, I thought I I remember that yeah, we did. Monday, Kevin's. you accepted yep. Kevin's retirement yep. right. notice. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, so there's several appointments that um, Carolyn Ness, who was our former select board member, um, separate committee she was on. Mm -hmm. I know that you all know that these committees are going to need to have the um, have some consideration. Yep. Um, you're also going to see your annual appointments list. It is in development. Okay. I have a copy that I've been scribbling on, but I wasn't able to get it printed for you today. That's fine. So That's I'm sweet. thinking we might just email it out separately or print okay. it for you. That's fine. Um, but do keep in mind that something like Capital Improvement Planning Committee, um, I've been told by the chair of that committee that he'd like to start going through a longer term evaluation process to develop, to develop more long term um, planning. Great. So he wants to start earlier this year. So mm -hmm. he's intending to start sometime in the summer. Okay. So those things are probably going to need to be on your radar screen relatively soon. Okay. And I did warn Blake when I first started talking to him that we'll start seeing appointments for police and EMS, and then mm -hmm. there'll be a barrage of pages and pages of appointments. Yep. Um, the 
Next placeholder, do you mind if I move forward, Mr. Please, Jim? please. Um, so there's three things in the next placeholder, and Blake, this is a placeholder that's sort of for policies or job descriptions, related documents that the board might have to look at. Um, sometimes we have things in there, sometimes we don't. In this case, you have three things in front of you. Um, the special municipal employee designation policy, which it's a policy, but it's really the designation, and that is a list of committees and specific individual import appointments that the board addresses on an intermittent basis. And this hasn't been updated since 2014, I think. I think we did one update last year because we saw a couple missing committees. I noticed a few more. So I, I asked that we bring this forward after, and I think I noticed it in like February or something. So. I ask that we bring this forward after town meeting. So there's that. And this actually has to get published with the state. So it has Amazing. to be a formal vote. How many different entities? And so you'll notice that I forgot a few. So there's a highlighted thing in your, you. in your packets. Um, and then the town accountant job description, we need the board to approve that. Personnel board has approved it. And the select board seen it a couple times. The last one is the other post-employment benefits policy. This hasn't been re-evaluated for several years, and I received a recommendation from Brenda Hill, our accountant, to add a bullet point on, which is the last bullet point, for your consideration. She thinks that this will be very helpful for us when we do, go to do our next uh, ban and mm -hmm. have our financials reviewed in the marketplace, which is what happens when you do a ban. Uh, a ban is a bond anticipation note or a bond note. Um, she wanted me to get this done before certainly June if we could. So it's a fairly simple policy. You'll find that there's the draft policy that has been revised and then underneath that I gave the background document which is the first policy and its relation to the OPEP trust because we have funding. The funding that we do put in goes into a trust and hopefully is to, it's building money so it allows us to, if, if and when we have to fully fund something, we have more money there. Um, so those are the three things in that placeholder. So we need to do each one of these separately? If you would be so kind as to take a vote for each one, I would really appreciate it. All right. And so the first one was the special municipal employees? Yes. And basically, this is a list of everybody that has to be defined as a special. The list of all the committees, including the ad hoc committees right. and the committee I forgot, which was the newer one, which was 1888 building. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, somebody want to make a motion? Sure. Uh, make a motion to approve the list of special municipal uh, employees um, as it relates to the law cited, uh, General Law Chapter 268A, Section 1. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Next. I'll make a motion to approve the accountant budget director financial um, for the financial department um, job description, grade G, exempt. So I'll second that for discussion. Okay. Um, this is something that you developed in cooperation with Brenda Hill and um, yes. updating what has been her job description. And right. We updated her job description and essentially added elements that weren't included before, mm -hmm. some of which are requirements to attend town meeting. And her presence is necessary for financial reasons. It certainly keeps us all on point when it comes to the budget. Um, but there's other elements of that job that weren't identified. So she and I took a, a good hard look at that job description. And this was in March. Yeah, early March, and then personnel board chewed on it for a month, and they approved it back in April. Um, so it, we tried to take elements of other job descriptions, but really what she'd experienced in the position itself, because this isn't just being the accountant, this is actually being the budget director too. Mm -hmm. And so there's elements of how the person in the position interacts with other employees is required to review when I said Trevor was the, the third level of checks and balances earlier. Really, the accountant is the auditor. And so we sure. wanted to capture as much of that detail as we could without it being overly obnoxious in terms of length. Right. So we tried to find a balance for that. And she, she definitely, you know, this, this person would, 
as Brenda does now, really is the go-between between between a lot of the department heads that come in, wondering how to do something, how to fund something. Um, You know, hey, I want to do this program, or I want to buy this. Um, Is this, you know, is this right? Is it, you know, am I? Am I pulling it out of the right line? Am I not overspending? Is it, do we have a certain fund that this is supposed to be? They're really, um, I can't stress how important this job is to the town of Deerfield and how well she does it. And Um, we are very lucky to have somebody in that position with that experience because she, one thing that we identify in the job description is the certification requirements because it's significant. It's a three-year process. Someone who's fiscally conservative. It's always a benefit. She's too. very conservative. I love it. But yeah, she really very sure every everything. It just makes sure she we and I argue about this correctly. That. Are we doing it right? Are we following the laws? And then she will reach out to Tom Scanlon, our auditor, and check with him on stuff. And you know, she manages all the grants, the funding for the grants. So it's it's a huge it's a huge job, definitely a huge job. So reporting to her, I know that we talked about department heads, but what about the committees that also have budgets that they have to? They, they coordinate them, with her as well. They were reporting to her, yep. Yep. coordinating with her as well. Right. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, she does a lot of outreach, particularly with, for instance, because, um, why am I blanking? Um, <laughs> Community Preservation Committee. Yep. She does a lot of coordination with them to help them develop the motions for the funding sources. Mm-hmm. So just little things like that that you don't really think about. Yep. But are and very important. So, so, we're so those well, little things, though, with finance committee as well. She does most of the management of making sure the information is provided to the finance committee and to yep. the select board, and it certainly helps me because I coordinate with capital, and then we mm-hmm. coordinate the whole big shebang together. Um, so it's it's a vital position. Yep, for sure, and it looks good. I, I, I'm right over this. I feel pretty good about this. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to say, I know we, we probably got this today, and if you want to take a week, we can we can finalize approval of it next next yep. official meeting. Me or, because I thankfully, Brenda's not leaving no. immediately. <laughs> so, but uh, um, yeah, if you feel comfortable, waiting. we can we, we can, can do it tonight, whatever you want to do. Two weeks and just vote well, it next time, What's too. the consensus over there on the other side? I'm, I'm good with it. I feel good with yeah, it. Because I, you know, I, I did read this today. I yeah. did go through it. So okay. it feels I feel comfortable. comfortable with it. Yeah, yep. okay. Well, um, motion has been made and seconded, and there's no further discussion. Um, all those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. And what's Tim nice Hilchey, is we, aye. Can, we can always address this again you know if something comes up or we find something we right should, if we find we, something we that i think we need to I mean, think about or change i usually will bring it up to both the personnel board and the select board right. yep so i i'm under the stand under i understand that there's policies and anything to do with personnel can be changed for sure you know right. to update right because yep. as we move forward things That's are right. going to change as well so yep exactly okay. thanks mm-hmm. to town meeting approving you know, pulling a lot of stuff out of bylaws that were so, you know, you're walking around with cement shoes on, you couldn't really do anything. Yeah. And in this marketplace, you need that flexibility. So it's, it's good. Yeah, we're able to kind of, uh, you know, working with the personnel board and, and the select board yep. to get stuff done. Yep. So now, is, is OPEB somewhere in here? Yes, that's the next one. I think uh, it's after one. the job description. So, okay. Um, do you want me to read this statement? Well, if you want to. Yeah. Or what? Yep. Like, So um, this is the Deerfield um, Other Post-Employment Benefits Funding Policy Statement. So the purpose of the OPEB funding policy is to state the funding goals for the town of Deerfield. The OPEB annual target funding contribution rate will be calculated to equal 4% of the town's prior fiscal year's total health insurance costs for town employees, active and retired, uh, but at no time will be less than $25,000. The town of Deerfield will amend the policy as needed uh, to meet these funding goals. And the funding goals are the town's objectives in the funding of the OPEB is to uh, trust is to accumulate sufficient assets to fully finance the town's accrued OPEB liability. Um, In meeting this objective, the town will strive to meet the uh, following funding goals. To maintain a stable or increasing ratio of system asset to accrue uh, liabilities and eventually reach 100% funding ratio as defined below. Uh, To provide uh, intergenerational equity for taxpayers with respect to town costs after fully funding the legal 
uh, liability for pension liabilities, retire, um, this is the regional retirement appropriation, currently scheduled through 2035, those funding dollars would be redirected to the OPEB. So we're funding retirement now, and once that's kind of uh, up to snuff, we would then take that money that we normally put towards that um, and put it towards the OPEB to start raising the money there. Because there, there's this delta where there's a liability and then what we're paying and right now that it's just growing and growing and eventually we're going to be hit with all the people who retire all of their benefits that aren't paid normally are still on the town so it's it's a huge liability long term it, as it is in every part with the state every town right, is facing schools, this yeah i understand else. that but we we really need to um we need to do more than the four percent what we were hoping to do if we had marijuana money coming in if we had solar field money coming in, anything that was like extra money that would come to the town that we're not using right now for our budget, we could gear towards that, but we just haven't been able to wrangle anything yet. So we, we started with this 4% just to kind of get a number going. We did that maybe four or five years ago. Yeah, I think it was before I came back. Yep, and so each year we vote it into annual town meeting, but it's never enough. But it's a, you know, it helps because it, it affects our bond rating. When we go it to does. borrow, they look at your liability and they say, well, if you're not even addressing it, you know, you're, you're not going to get as good a rate. So, yeah. but we're at least addressing it. We have a policy and a, and a trust. So what do we need to motion on this? Please. Yeah, you need yeah. to you need to officially make a motion and approve it. Um, the element that is the change here is the money, the funding related, the the statement that says when we finish um, funding okay. the retirement piece, we'll redirect the funds. That was the sentence that I think could be it. Brenda's okay. take on that. Yeah. What it would is it yep. would be more advantageous yeah, in terms of our, our bond evaluations. That was our for sure. Okay, so I'll make a motion to approve the Deerfield Other Post-Employment Benefits OPEB funding policy statement as presented by the town administrator. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Trevor McDaniel? Aye. Blake Gilmore? Aye. Tim Hilchey? Aye. That was a pregnant pause. Great. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Did I say aye? <laughs> I know. I know, there was... <laughs> all right. Um, so... Geothermal biological. So the permit, so the, I had asked when I received a question about this, I asked for a permit fee, sort of a comparison. Oh. And I don't expect you guys to vote this tonight. This is the first time you've seen it. But what I was thinking is if I give it to you tonight, we can sort of take the approach that we took with the town accountant position and give you a few, a few days or a few weeks to chew on it and we can circle back around. But there are a few types of permits that have languished and not had real adjustments in the last several years. And some of them are plumbing and electrical. One thing that I, when I looked at this, I was like, what was it? What is it? Like, what's So the, I noticed that too. Right? There's no like comparison of what other towns are doing or... What so I think I do. missed a tab when I was printing, but oh, I'll go okay. back and look at it. I think I <laughs> might have, have missed a tab because okay. like, I was looking at it. I'm like, wait a minute, that doesn't, doesn't look great. Really so tell us what, yeah. what we're doing. No, so. I think that's also okay, my bad. Okay, so we can look at it next time. But I figured, if nothing else, I've started the conversation. Perfect. It's great. It's great. All right. Um, so do we have anything else? I mean, I have one turn. thing that was an item unanticipated that I just realized. All right. Um, so, Tim, I don't know if you remember this, but and I've got something for you guys to look at. So, the Mass Office of Travel and Tourism has a new program that they're working on, and they've got grants coming out. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, Historic Deerfield has applied for one of them. Oh. And they asked us for a letter of support, and I didn't realize yeah. what sort of their deadline was looking at, but essentially what they'd like to be able to do is compete with this grant program. That's great. And draw some attention to the Yeah, town. yeah, I'm all about this. I yeah. had a brief overview from Director Gobi's office when she, she does her world meetings every week or so, and they had the Mass Office of Travel and Tourism come and explain the grant. Yeah. And it's Let's really, it. It, it could be a huge opportunity to get some focus on Deerfield because yes. they plan to travel all over the state and sort this of provide a map for people to visit various places. So, it's you know. It's so unique. This it's, town is just it amazing. Is, it is. It's and amazing. And so I realized so, yeah. that I had made a mistake and they have a deadline on this. <laughs> and 
we won't be able to hit their deadline if you guys don't take it under so, advisement at least. Um, why don't I just read it um, and, yep. and then we'll act on it. Dear members of the Grant Review Committee, on behalf of the Town of Deerfield Select Board, I would like to offer strong endorsement of Historic Deerfield's application for funding to support the reinstallation of its outdoor signage. The museum's signs convey critical wayfinding information to visitors while also providing interesting details about the historic houses and other museum buildings that line Old Main Street. With more than a dozen buildings that are open to the visiting public, plus a modern museum building, a museum store, several maintenance and administrative buildings, and requisite parking areas spread out over a mile long street. Historic Deerfield signage is extensive and necessary for visitor navigation and enjoyment. Historic Deerfield is one of several institutions in our region of significant importance to the local and regional tourism economy. The town of Deerfield, as well as the broader Western Massachusetts region, depends on tourism and welcomes visitors from near and far. And I can attest to the interest in local history and its importance in driving visitors to our area. In fact, Historic Deerfield brings our area national and inter international recognition as a tourist destination and a center for scholarship. For more than 70 years, Historic Deerfield has brought tens of thousands of visitors to the region each year. These individuals support the local economy by staying in our hotels, eating in our restaurants, and purchasing items in our shops. They are a key partner in tourism and play an important role in attracting visitors to the region. For these reasons, I encourage you to consider funding this project and I thank you for your critically important role you play in supporting travel and tourism-based organizations in the Commonwealth. Sincerely, Deerfield Board of Select Chair. I have Tim written down as the yeah. chair, because yeah. sometimes I just, you know, we do with the chair. Will it as help to have to all whole, three I the members? I think it on. makes sense to have all yeah. three members, right? Because yeah. okay. we, and, and I mean, I support this 100%. If you give me five minutes, I can fix it. That's yeah. fine, yeah. fix it yeah. and sign it. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I just didn't know if you guys would be willing to do yes, it. I just no, don't want to sink their battleship, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't realize I had missed it. So. Yeah, let's do it. No, let's do it. As um, long as nobody has any issues, I'll go reprint it if you want. Yeah, yep, that's thank fine. you. Okay. And is there anything else? Or, I no, mean, that, I gave you my report in yeah, two we'll different reports. So, and so we'll just wait I'm trying to meeting. facilitate yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. You know, faster meetings with you. So. Yep. yep. No, it's great. All right. Um, All right, so that'll be so, just while we're waiting for that, um, there was, oh, this was the, the uh, SRF funding application. I was thinking about the plant. Um, Mass Department of Environmental Protection is pleased to announce this state revolving fund SRF protection uh, solicitation for new drinking water or clean water project is now open. So um, they're accepting project evaluation forms, um, I think until, July, uh, July 26. So I thought it might be worth yeah, seeing if it might be a part. I don't know if it's going to be anything we can do, but well, there, the, the thing that was most encouraging to me in the first paragraph is, is the sewer grants. Right. Uh, grant. It's a great word. Yeah. So that's why, you know, I wanted Chris yeah. and Christopher to just start looking into that right yeah. away. See if it's anything we can do. Um, do uh, I would make a motion to uh, approve the chair uh, the select board to sign the emergency declaration that we approved last week. Have a second. Yeah. Second. Yep. Yeah. Right. Any further discussion? Nope. All right. Uh, hearing none. All those in favor? Trevor McDaniel, aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. I don't know if you have a copy already. Yeah. Oh, you do. Okay, yeah. great. I, That's good. I anticipated that we <laughs> would get to that at some point. My yeah. And then she's under this pile. Fred. Yeah. Uh, Here it is. Yeah. Fred Beckett had sent. Um, uh, a letter about um, you know doing the approvals on Eastern, Grace, Grace Eastern. Eastern. So I think um, I, I think we were going to take that letter, edit it, possibly get it on town letterhead, talk with the attorneys, but just you know keep that process moving. And thank yep. them for that effort mm -hmm. to kind of keep yeah, that rolling. Yeah, we should see if we can't figure out who's going to rewrite the letter. I'm not going to do it. Um, you're, you're, no, um, you were the. Christopher Dunn or oh, Christopher okay. Nolan, right. Chris Nolan. I mean, basically, we just want to get in the get in the part about the signatures, you know, to this letter are, are are giving us permission to be on their property to, yes. you know, right. dig one this trench. Want to evaluate to start to work. Yeah. And so that. and then let the, the let the lawyers tell us if that's sufficient or if they need sounds to have other good. language. So that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, yep. Great. Thank you. 
said five minutes. I have nothing else. <laughs> uh, no. Do you want a motion to adjourn? How was the asphalt signature? day? Okay, well, What's that? for what I was there, it was... It was oh, asphalt day, yes. It was uh, basically most of the state uh, DOT was there. Yep. And uh, I got to see a little bit of their undercover lab that was there, but I didn't stay long enough to get yeah. the I know the you had to run, thing, run so. out, out to Boston. But it was interesting because they were uh, very cordial and really welcoming to get everybody in there. Nice. And uh, I'd say there was about 30 to 40 people in there. Great. So for well, National turnout. Asphalt Day, um, <laughs> I... <laughs> they had a pretty good I thought it was international asphalt. Yeah, could That's be. right. Could I'm sorry. It was international. Yeah. And the only thing I didn't have time for was I was looking to see if they were going to give out free samples. <laughs> yeah. Can we get a size of a parking lot free sample? <laughs> Mr. Chair, before you adjourn, may I ask a question? Yes, by all means. So um, I was I was wondering if you all had any feedback for the motions, the, the very mini packet that I put together today. Yes. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Did it I help? Thought it, did it make it more chaotic? What, what are the thoughts? I thought it was very helpful. It, it, once I could find it, I, you know, I knew I had it, and, and it was over here, and I'm looking over here. But, yeah, I, I think going forward, we probably won't have as many of these on every meeting, but I find it helpful. Sure. I, yeah, yeah, this I, was a very dense meeting. Yeah, my, my uh, thoughts are we could slim because I know it's a lot of work right to put all that together so what is helpful is that we don't uh, is that we have some language on on kind of important things that are um, laid out succinctly instead of saying oh yeah what he said turn that into a motion you know um, so it, right. it it makes it a little more professional better for the minutes um, so I, I do like that um, but finding a balance between like all of your time writing all of that right and sure and but but just having them for the important votes i think are, are most important yeah and there's some things that require like a case he needs us to say something in a specific way yeah and uh, rather than us trying to guess and messing up three times <laughs> you know if we, we just have i'm the, I'm the queen of that <laughs> yeah, so I really thought it was helpful. Yeah, I did too. Okay. But just, yeah. So I'll keep doing it, but I, I might pare it down a little from yes. when I, I, it was, yeah, personally yeah. it was a dense meeting, but also yeah. I, I probably did some that weren't entirely necessary. Yeah, so. we don't, we don't need the, like the negative ones either, I and, think. And hopefully as we go forward sure. with, um, you know, with, with having a, a meeting on Monday to finalize the agenda, some of these things will fall away because like we had a Synaxo one today, which we turns out we didn't need. So, yep. yeah, it should be a little sure. easier going forward. We'll try yeah. to focus on... We appreciate the help. Yeah. For sure. And, so, and the other question, did the, the stapling of the individual sections of the packet together, is that helpful? It is helpful. It I, is. Okay. Yeah. As I'm trying to look at stuff, uh, it is helpful for sure. I know it's... Because um, sometimes you'll get, like, if you're printing on multiple pages, it's hard to staple. Like, it's hard to find stuff sometimes that way. Because I know when you print the packet, it's like all running to save paper. But if it's stapled, it, it's a little easier to kind of separate out what topic we're on it at the time. So I think sure. it's helpful. It's certainly helpful to me. Yeah. For sure. I keep everything, so it's really good to, to have it organized. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So, yeah, I will keep doing essentially what I did this evening and making sure that our office is, is making those preparations necessary super helpful yeah yep. and as, as we move on to train another person to handle this part of the process you know it would be good mm -hmm. yeah yeah anything else excellent no, motion I'll to take adjourn. a motion to adjourn <laughs> second all right all those in favor trevor mcdaniel aye blake gilmore aye tim hilchie aye all thank right. you all for coming out tonight <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it. Your too. I'm like, recording stopped